City. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief, the ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolio. We're tracking early session volume while bringing today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. Happy Monday. We've got a busy show for you this morning. Stock futures taking a breather following a hot AI-fueled rally last week. Timing of interest rate cuts, a top of mind concern here as inflation data out this week could test the market's momentum. We'll get the latest reading of PCE, the Federal Reserve's preferred inflation gauge. That's coming Thursday. And it's another busy week of earnings with Salesforce, Lowe's, Macy's, Okta, and Best Buy among the big names on deck. It's the latest round of results that's going to give investors just another look at the state of the consumer, also the strength that we could potentially still be looking at in tech. So let's get right to it with the three things that you need to know, your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Brian Zazi, Madison Mills, and Jared Blickery have more. All right, futures are searching for direction this morning after a blowout earnings report from AI darling NVIDIA sent stocks to record highs last week. The largest challenge to markets in the week ahead will likely come from the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index, the Federal Reserve's preferred inflation gauge. That's out on Thursday. And a historic day for Walmart. This is the largest retailer in the U.S. They will begin trading on a post-split basis at the market open coming up at 9.30 today. The three-for-one stock split is going to increase the number of common stock shares to about $8.1 billion. That's going to be up from 2.7 billion shares before this split. Now, this is the 12th time in 50 years that Walmart has done a stock split in an effort to make shares more affordable for its employees. And investors are digesting Warren Buffett's annual letter to Berkshire Hathaway shareholders. Shares of Berkshire, they are rising about 1.5%, 2% on the letter. The conglomerate, they're closing in on the $1 trillion market cap milestone. The letter released on Saturday kicks off by paying tribute to his longtime right-hand man and vice chairman, Charlie Munger, who died last November at the age of 99. Buffett goes on to disclose Berkshire hit an all-time high annual profit in 2023 and has record cash levels of just over $167 billion. Today's top story, the AI-fueled rally is taking a bit of a breather here. Stock futures searching for direction a bit this morning as investors await the release of the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, PCE. That's coming Thursday. But before then, we've got Yahoo Finance executive editor Brian Sazi here with us. Hey, Brian. Yeah, uh, Brad, I'm just looking at uh, the Yahoo Finance app real quick. Uh, and NVIDIA shares up 1.5% pre-market. I have five-year chart. You toggle to it. I mean, it's just gone through the roof. But uh, I wrote about recently uh, the potential that this all can essentially be a bubble. You can find that piece on the Yahoo Finance homepage. It really took off over the weekend in terms of just social media activity, so please keep the comments coming. I'm learning a lot from this. But I point to three things in this story that would suggest we are, in fact, or investors are, in fact, living in an AI uh, bubble or a hype cycle. Everything is rallying. Look what NVIDIA reported last week. You saw shares of AMD uh, tick higher. You saw Intel tick higher. You saw Meta tick higher. I would argue in a normal environment, you do not see shares of AMD and Intel tick higher after a blowout quarter for NVIDIA because NVIDIA numbers are telling you maybe they're taking market share from AMD and Intel. Totally bonkers. And then on Meta, just because they're using NVIDIA chips, uh, the market is suggesting they might have blowout earnings later this year. That just doesn't make a lot of sense to me, at least right now. Number two, I've seen a lot of folks on the street really focus on uh, valuations on these AI stocks, and they're justifying even higher valuations for these stocks that wouldn't even be normal. You look at, uh, you go to Yahoo Finance, you tick on the uh, statistics page, NVIDIA shares trading about 30 times forward earnings. That is well above the broader market multiple about 23 times. And yeah, I get it. NVIDIA should be trading at a higher multiple than the market. It is growing faster. But still, that is some uh, near record high valuations for NVIDIA, and they are not alone. And a lot of folks in the street are justifying this as normal. And I would argue it's not. And then lastly, uh, I think you're seeing a lot of folks think that they are absolutely unstoppable investors. They are investing geniuses. And who's flashing these folks? You're really not. What you're essentially seeing is a lot of stocks rising, uh, it, rising tide lifting all boats in many markets, notably that Magnificent Seven. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel like you really know what you're doing. And I would argue now is the time to go back and just reassess what you are in fact doing. 
Remember that fundamentals do drive stock prices. And I point to a really good uh, uh, study or a piece of research out of the Schwab team suggesting that uh, investor confidence is at the highest level they have ever seen in doing this their survey. Most investors are absolutely bullish on tech stocks. Shocker. But again, there's a lot of optimism here on the AI train. I saw it right through my social media feeds all weekend. There certainly is. It's playing on the social media. It's been playing on the market now for quite some time. And Sazi, similar to your point, Torsten Slack was out uh, with the chart here this morning talking about the current AI bubble right now. He was actually making a comparison here saying that it's bigger than the 1990s tech bubble. But Sazi, I'm curious from what you've heard from viewers, what you're reading here from some of the readers that have commented on your piece, how would you compare this sentiment today to what we've seen in the past, given your experience and your coverage of some of the other blips, to call it, to say so the least, me in old, the market? Right? Good, because I call I'm myself old, old in the story. experience, right? Uh, like you put it. I'm seasoned. All right, I appreciate that. <laughs> but it is. I think uh, investors are caught in a classic classic bubble. And how can you tell that? All that activity that are those, these folks that are replying to me on social media, I don't get the sense, and via email I should say, I don't get their sense they're ready to exit NVIDIA or exit yeah. these MAG7 stocks. If anything, they have been more emboldened by the AI hype cycle and they can't see the other side of the trade. And my point in this piece was that at some point it does end badly. Maybe it's not today, maybe it's not tomorrow, but I think in this environment you have to go back and calc value, calculate valuations on the Magnificent Seven and really drill down. Is it truly justified that by the cash flows and profits that will be coming over the next two to three years? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but again, I think you have to go through that exercise. Well, you already had Jeffries come out last week and say that NVIDIA is essentially the de facto ecosystem standard for AI, and they pointed back to exactly what we're talking about, the historical context of this all too, and saying typically a single general purpose ecosystem captures 80% of the value of each computing era. You look back to PCs, you look back to Apple and smartphones there too. And so now this is how NVIDIA is trying to cement their own positioning within this inferential AI moment. That One we're last having. reminder, stocks don't go up every single day. And at some point there they will be up. a correction. Yeah, there will be a correction. But like you've said in the past, they do go up most I'm not times. making stock calls here. I just, you know, I want, to be, I want people to be reminded what, sure. what goes on out there. That's All fair. right, well, let's get to another big story of the day of the week. The Federal Reserve expected to loosen monetary policy this year after bringing interest rates to their highest level in more than two decades. But we know sticky inflation, strong jobs data, and cautious commentary from the Fed is causing investors to re-examine the timing of that first rate cut. Now, currently 20% of traders expect the Fed to cut in May. That's down from 28% just a week ago. More data out this week is going to help guide the central bank's decision, including the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, PCE. That's out on Thursday. Here with more, we want to bring in Mark Zandi. He's Moody's Analytics Chief Economist. Mark, it's great to talk to you again. So talk to us just about where things stand today, because you and I have talked many times in the past just about the timing of that first rate cut, the fact that the Fed right now seems to prefer the risk of staying higher for longer versus cutting too soon. Is that the right strategy? Well, if I were king for the day, Sean, I'd probably begin cutting rates sooner rather than later, uh, you know, because uh, at the end of the day, the Fed Reserve has... Uh, more or less it hit its targets. It's uh, it's dual mandate. It has two objectives. One is to achieve full employment. I think we're there. 3.67% unemployment rate would be consistent with that. And on inflation, you know, we're we're not quite at target, but within spitting distance. I mean, on a six, six e, take uh, the PCE number that you mentioned that's going to come out uh, for the month of January in a few days, even if it comes in strong as a consensus expects, up 0.4% on the month, on a three-month basis, six-month basis, 12-month basis annualized, we're well into the twos. So we're within spitting distance of the Fed's 2% inflation target. And, you know, I think that's close enough to begin to start cutting rates and not run the risk of, of pushing the economy into a ditch. And the economy's fine. It's resilient. But, you know, there are some signs of stress, uh, particularly in the labor market. And, uh, you know, growth is uh, you know a bit more pedestrian than I think the top line numbers suggest. So, and the financial system is under a lot of pressure given the inverted yield curve and a higher rate. So, why take the chance when you're you know on you're so close to achieving your goals? But why is it that you think the Fed would not be satisfied, Mark, with with a two handle on that number if we were to finally get that on on a 12 month basis? As you mentioned, on a six month, we, we had already seen that come in at about 2.6 percent and, and be sitting there as of right now. Yeah, I uh, I think they uh, they they want certainty. They they want to be at target, which I you know I find uh, a little bit of a different message than they were sending us uh, three six nine months ago. Uh, they were saying you know if we're 
headed towards target and all the trend lines look good and you can do a reasonably confident forecast that we're going to get back to target, that would be sufficient to, to have them start cutting rates. But now the bar is higher. It feels like it's higher. Uh, they want to be absolutely sure that you know we are at that tar uh, at the target, and they're going to wait a little bit longer. But again, you know, and you know, at, at, at the end of the day, I think the economy is resilient enough to take uh, higher rates for for longer. But uh, I, I got some beginning to wonder why take that risk, given given that uh, you know, we're so close to achieving those so that that dual man mandate, those two objectives. Rock, if they do, in fact, uh, decide to delay that first rate cut, what does that do to the soft landing narrative? And how much does that put the potential here to avoid a recession at risk? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the economy is resilient enough. I mean, if, I don't know if this makes a big difference, Sean, if, if they cut in uh, in March or w whether it's in May. But uh, I, I do think with each passing FOMC meeting that they don't cut rates, the probability that they undermine the soft landing will rise. Now, at this point, it feels pretty low, but that could change very, you know, very, very quickly. Uh, and I, I mentioned earlier from the financial system, you know, generally what happens is the financial system, financial markets are fine, no problem, everything feels really good. I heard your the previous uh, commentator on the markets. You know, everything's okay, feels great. We all think we're geniuses, and but things can change very, very rapidly. and in a high rate environment, uh, that's the fodder for you know rapid change in sentiment. So uh, again, you know why take that chance given given where things are. How does the inflationary environment right now in the U.S. compare to some of what you're tracking from other countries as well, Mark? Well, inflation is down everywhere, uh, Brad, uh, and this goes to the reasons why inflation has been so elevated. It goes to the pandemic and. The impact on supply chains, labor markets, and the Russian war in Ukraine its impact on energy and agricultural markets. As those two shocks fade into the rearview mirror, and they are, they're becoming less of an issue with each passing day, inflation is coming in uh, pretty much everywhere um, and uh, it, pretty close to target. And that's why central banks everywhere, including the Fed, the European Central Bank, the Bank of Canada, the Bank of England, everyone's thinking about uh, cutting rates and exactly when to cut rates. And that's because inflation has come in here uh, reasonably gracefully. And I think that'll continue. Mark, when it comes to housing, you and I have talked about that many times in the past. There is some signs, I guess, of life in the housing market. We can take a look at those existing home sales ticking up here to start the year. We're going to get a reading on new home sales in just a bit. What's your assessment just of the pickup that we're seeing in activity and whether or not that points to maybe a more positive year than we had initially expected? Uh, yeah, you're splitting hairs. It was up a little bit, Sean. I mean, still very. Trying to be very optimistic low. here, Mark, to start uh, the week. Yeah, but but I, I and I I concur with that optimism. I I mean, I think we can say with strong conviction that that uh, the the housing market in terms of home sales and demand probably at bottom. Uh, obviously, very rate sensitive. The fixed the thirty year fixed mortgage rates around seven percent. If it goes north of uh, up here, then we got a problem. If it goes continues to move lower, you know, towards six, I think uh, we'll we'll be fine. And I think everything indicates that we're going to be. It's more likely we're going to go towards six by the end of the year than eight. So if that's the case, then yeah, I think we should start to see an improvement in home sales. But I I think this is a process. I, I don't think this is going to be one day we wake up and the market's back. It's going to take a couple three years because of that interest rate lock. You've got so many homeowners out there with such, with mortgages with such low interest rates. I think the average uh, coupon uh, on an existing mortgage is a three and a half percent. So three and a half percent compared to seven, you know, the economics don't work. So it's going to take a while to get home sales back up to something I think folks feel comfortable with, but, uh, but we're heading that direction. I will say we'll get there a lot faster if people start cutting prices. I mean, if you look at new home sales, they're actually pretty good. They're, you know, 750, we'll get another read on that today. But they're hanging around uh, where you'd expect them in the long run. And that's because home builders, they've been aggressive. They've been effectively cutting price through interest rate buy down. So, you know, if, if existing home sellers start to lower their price a little bit, uh, we'll, we'll start to get more home sales. Uh, uh, I, they're reluctant to do that. But if they want to move their home, I think, uh, you know, they may have to do that at some point down the road here. Yeah, the median sale price of existing homes up another 5% at the last reading here in January. So certainly we have seen that trend continue to the upside. Mark, always great to talk to you. Thanks so much for making the time with us this morning. Yeah, anytime. Take care.
All right, well, it's time for today's stock to watch, and that is Walmart. Three-for-one stock split going into effect today after closing at 175.56 on Friday. Now, pre-market trading accounting for the stock split with the retail giant trading just around 59 here in pre-market activity. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills is on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with the breakdown. Madison. Yeah, Shauna, so folks here at NICE reminding me and our viewers to not spit out your coffee when you see that Walmart is trading near 60 bucks a share, heading into the market open coming up in about 15 minutes here. That lowered share price is going to be due to exactly what you mentioned, that three-for-one stock split. And this comes, as the CEO was saying on the earnings call, that it was important to the Waltons family always that uh, the stock was accessible for employees. Remember that Walmart is the largest employer in the U.S., and certainly the largest brick and mortar retailer as well. So that's part of the reason that's driving this stock split. It's also another one of the companies this earnings cycle upping their dividends, a 9% hike. So you're going to get about 83 cents annually for that dividend. A big payout there, but certainly bigger if you are one of those employees participating in this uh, stock program that Walmart offers its employees, which also includes a match from Walmart, the company as well. The reason this is our stock to watch, though, what I want to point out to our audience is if you look at the Yahoo Finance platform right now on YF Plus, you can see that this stock is trading near the top of the 52-week range, but just at the bottom of the day's range. So I'm curious to see what happens heading into the market open, if some of those orders that folks put in to be able to get in on this stock once it's a little bit lower are going to up the stock price. We'll see coming up in about 15 minutes here. All right, Maddie, thanks so much. Taking a look at shares of WMT going into the opening cross just about, as you mentioned, 14 15 minutes away from right now. We'll check back in, Maddie. Switching gears here, shares of Berkshire Hathaway rising pre-market after the Saturday release of Warren Buffett's annual letter to Berkshire Hathaway shareholders. The company reported record profits in 2023, as well as cash holdings that hit a record for the fourth quarter. It is the company's first report since the passing of its vice chair, Charlie Munger. For more on this, we turn to Gregory Warren, who is the Morningstar strategist and senior stock analyst. Thanks so much for taking the time here this morning, Gregory. I mean, let's talk about some of the records that we saw come in for Berkshire Hathaway. Way, the record cash balance, the profit here. What is most significant as this company really repositions some of its largest investments and really looks across where there are moats, regardless of the economic environment? Well, I, I think Berkshire has been in sort of a conundrum for, for, for quite some time now. Um, it, Buffett gets credit, Buffett and Munger both, you know, when, when he was still with the firm, um, got credit over the years for being very, very disciplined, especially when it looks to acquisitions. So they weren't out there chasing um, a lot of deals just to put money to work. And the the byproduct of that is they've had a lot of cash build up on the balance sheet. If we look back at the past five years, they were generating around $25.5 billion a year in free cash flow, and that's you know, it's for cash flow from operations, less the capital expenditures. So beyond sort of the regular money they were putting to work uh, on CapEx, they were still churning out a ton of cash. And it's really hard to sort of dispense of all that capital every year. And for a while there, they were able to sort of offset some of that with sherry purchases, but the past couple of years, it's been harder and harder because the valuation on the firm has gotten higher and higher. So it's been a difficult situation, um, you know, for Berkshire to be in. Um, you know, we, we were kind of concerned, you know, a, a few years back, Buffett had made the comment that he couldn't sit here with $150 billion in cash and pretend to shareholders that it was something brilliant. Um, but back when he said it in 2017, um, short-term rates were at zero. You know, now they're at 5% plus. So we've been a little bit less concerned about that cash balance creeping up past $150 billion than we thought we would be. But that's because they're earning a lot on that right now. So from, mm. from, from that perspective, it's, it's just it's, – it's an interesting period for Berkshire right now. And, and it has been for, for a number of years because they've just not been able to find good enough deals to put the money to work in, which sort of begs the question, you know, is a dividend at some point coming? Should share purchase be ramped up? Yeah, I mean, I know, I know Buffett's answer to that, but I think that that's something that the next guys who run the firm are really going to have to address when they take over. And what's your expectation there, Gregory? Um, I, th I think longer term. I, I mean, I know Buffett's been, you know, really against the dividend, you know, overall because you know his his thought is 
we could do better with this cash than the most investors. And, you know, once you start a commitment to that dividend and you have to sort of stick to it. And, and I understand both of his arguments, but I, I think he's also really sort of leaving that as a tool for the next management team because he doesn't want to sort of commit them to something that they may not be able to sort of maintain over a, a long, long, you know, time frame. But, you know, it, it also gives those guys sort of that ability, you know, Greg Abel's, you know, at this point, the heir apparent to be able to sort of step in and, and go to shareholders and say, look, I'm not Warren. I'm not Charlie. You know, we have a ton of capital on the books right now. Um, we want to start giving it back to shareholders in, in incremental amounts. This is how we're going to start doing it. You know, give us time to show you that we can still run this business the way it has. Because I think that was one of the more interesting things that came out of the the um, annual letter. And it was something we've been saying about Berkshire for a long time. You know, Buffett sort of referred to Charlie as the architect of the firm, and him the general contractor. Hmm. And in a lot of ways, it, Berkshire has been sort of set up as this decentralized organization that kind of runs itself yeah. you know so even if you know warren and charlie are no longer there at the helm the business should continue to run as it has historically where warren and you know, charlie's you know sort of benefits came into play was on a capital allocation front you know and i think what's what's going to happen is once <clears throat> once warren's gone it's going to be harder for management to say you know we're going to hold on to all this cash right you know, in anticipation, we could do a big deal down the road or whatever else. Right. I, I just think it's be harder and harder. And just with regard to that next big deal down the road, wh where is that next purchase opportunity? I mean, they've gone heavy into Japanese trading firms. They've gone heavy into Occidental Petroleum. We've seen how that's played out. Uh, they do have some AI bets within their portfolio. If you want to look at Apple, Amazon, Snowflake, yep. where is that next big purchase opportunity? It, it it's it's gotten harder and harder. I mean, I I think. I think we'll probably see more on the stock investment front than we will outright acquisitions. I mean, I think he even sort of noted that in the the, the letter this year that that so many of the businesses that they could buy that would be meaningful because Berkshire is such a big organization at this right. point um, have already been picked through. And it's, it's really sort of hard to find that next big deal that can be meaningful. I mean, Allegheny was, was, was a stroke of genius you know, with them picking that up because it melded perfectly with their existing organizations and provided a big boost last year to the to the insurance operations. But finding more deals like that, I think, are just going to be tougher for them to sort of pull off. And he did make the point that, you know, outside of the U.S., there aren't a whole lot of things out there that they could really sort of step into. Hmm. You know, they've made a commitment to the Japanese firms not to buy more than 10 percent of their companies, you know, and that's sort of been in, in – in tandem with you know deals and opportunities for them to sort of do partnerships longer term but it, i think it's just been harder and harder for them to find things that are of value that would really sort of move the needle and and, and i think that that's going to be the the, the the complicated thing for them going mm -hmm. forward you know i mean i think that the negative risk for for anybody in this position is they go out and do a big deal just to do a big deal. But I don't yeah. see Buffett doing that. I mean, he's very, very disciplined. Extremely disciplined and it has certainly paid off to say the least over the years. Well, Morning Stars, Gregory Warren, always great to have you. Thanks so much for your insight. Thanks for having me. All right, well, coming up, two Chinese EV giants getting a boost in the pre-market. We are going to break down some of Yahoo Finance's top trending tickers next.
time now for some trending tickers. Chinese EV maker BYD is proposing doubling its share buyback, saying it hopes to safeguard the interests of all shareholders by doing so. This comes as BYD unveils its most expensive vehicle yet, a sports car with a price tag of $233,000. So you're taking a look at shares up by about 1.5% right now. We know that this company has already done extremely well in combating and going up against and now outlasting or outpositioning itself against Tesla in a core region in China for its own growth in the Asia-Pacific region uh, and how Tesla has built out the Shanghai Gigafactory to try and service better into that region. But BYD is certainly capitalizing on some of the local consumer sentiment as well within the region. Yeah, they certainly are. Now, this move, a couple important things to point out. When it comes to the uh, potential buyback here, the reason why that is significant, obviously, it could potentially boost investor confidence here, something that would be more advantageous here to the company, stabilize, and also potentially enhance the current value. That is at least what the company sees in terms of the beneficiary as to why they would do this. Now, the second part of what you also just said there, Brad, was that more expensive vehicle that they did unveil yesterday. You can see right there on your screen in the lower third, $233,000. Putting that perspective, that puts it in direct competition, obviously, with the highest, spri highest priced uh, offerings out there when it comes to Ferrari, when it comes to Lamborghini. So shifting the narrative just a bit when it comes to BYD, a lot of people, when they initially think of it, think of those lower priced options when it comes to vehicles, right. but now clearly uh, going in at the other end of the spectrum with that higher priced offering. And stay tuned our, uh, for more on BYD. Our colleague Akiko Fujita is going to be speaking with the company's American CEO, Stella. Lee. That's coming up at 11.15 a.m. Eastern Time. Well, let's take a look at another training ticker that we are watching this morning, and that is Lee Auto shares jumping higher in the pre-market after reporting its first ever annual net profit. And the Chinese EV maker's deliveries nearly tripling from a year ago, but warning of a pullback to come this quarter. We're seeing the stock move to the upside just about 11%. So we're seeing this a surge here to the upside because it really was a lot of the neg negativity priced in. We talk about the fact that demand had been waning just a bit. Lots of questions about exactly what that would look like and how it would all play out for the remainder of 2024. So a bit of upbeat news here from the company. Its first annual net profit. That's enough to boost shares just over 10 percent here in pre-market. Yeah, no doubt. Great gross profit that they saw as well of about the equivalent of 1.38 billion U.S. dollars for the fourth quarter. That was an increase of, get this, 174.4 percent from the prior year's quarter. And you mentioned the broader kind of context around that shift, too, that we've seen, especially as it's come on the back of some of those quarter deliveries. The number, just to put a number on that, 131,805 vehicles delivered during the quarter. That brings the full year total to 376,000, just a little bit more than that. So that's going to be significant in cementing how this company continues to not just adapt to this consumer environment and where consumers are taking on price, but also just the competitive landscape where they're needing to continue to outlast some of that stiff competition within the region that we were just talking about as well. The margin's also interesting on this company as well. 22.7% margins that they're seeing per vehicle during the fourth quarter of 2023 here too. So really sustaining that going to be core to the fabric of this investor story as well. It certainly will. All right. Well, we are just about a minute away from the opening bell. So let's see how the futures are looking here in the final minute ahead of the open. You're still looking at a bit of pressure here as a broader market looks to take a bit of a break coming after last week's record-setting week. We know NVIDIA really fueled the market rally that we saw take place really for quite some months, but especially what happened on Thursday and Friday. You also have another important note to add here, Amazon joining the Dow at the open, replacing Walgreens, obviously adding a little bit more exposure to tech and consumer a retail within the Dow 30, so something to point out here. But again, as it looks here, head of the open, Brad, you have the NASDAQ features pointing to gains at the open, but the Dow under just a bit of pressure. It's going to be a big week on both the economic data front. We were mentioning PCE, personal consumption consumption expenditures. That's going to be coming out Thursday, but also Thursday, you're going to get a ton of Fed speak as well. You've got Bostic, Goolsby, Mester, uh, and Jeff Schmid speaking as well. Kansas City Fed president there. He's got a lot to cheer about coming off the Super Bowl, I suppose. All right. Well, there's the opening bell on Wall Street. Hey, National Women's Hall of Fame ringing the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange there. And then additionally, you've got, I, I assume that's just Spock, 
Spock is how we're going to pronounce that today. At the NASDAQ, ringing the opening bell. Yeah, press that button there, and you get some fun Funfetti on the other side. Okay, things officially open up here. We've got team coverage of the biggest market movers following the opening bell on Wall Street. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange Plus. Jared Blickery on standby at the Interactive after an NVIDIA-fueled rally last week. Maddie, what are you hearing around the exchange? I'm hearing a lot of meh activity following that bre record-breaking NVIDIA earnings report. It seems like this week we're just kind of tepidly awaiting that super core PCE number that's going to define what the Federal Reserve is going to do moving forward. Having said that, given that we've got a lot of interest rate sensitive parts of the market right now, I'm interested in some evidence of, dare I say, a broadening that we might be starting to see some evidence of. If you take a look at the S&P 500 equal weighted index, it does start to see some upward movement, particularly over the past two weeks here. That could be an indication that we are seeing some broadening. Uh, heading into the market open, the Russell 2000 was also up a little bit. I'm curious to see whether or not that's finally going to break out of the bearish trends that we've been seeing in that index. Uh, interesting quote from Ryan Dietrich on Twitter this morning saying that when the S&P 500 is higher in both January and February, the next 12 months have been higher 27 out of 28 times since 1950 with an average return of almost 15 percent. So some really bad news for the bears on Wall Street if you look at that statistic. If we look at some individual names, also Amazon, Walmart joining the Dow Jones Industrial Average this morning. I'm curious to see what happens with Walmart after their stock split. It looks like they're still trading right under 59 bucks in the market open this morning, guys. All right, Maddie, thanks so much. Let's kick it over to Jared Blicker who has a closer look at some of the other movement that we're seeing across the globe, Jared. That's right, Chana. We're seeing a little bit of weakness in the small caps. Russell 2000 down about a quarter of 1%, but the NASDAQ coming off of its loss Friday, that is up one-third of a percent. S&P 500 and the Dow are a little bit less than that. Let's check out the sector action for today. Last week, we had some value in cyclical sectors leading. Today, it is tech, and that has been the story for over a year. Uh, tech has been one of the biggest contributors to the S&P 500, and so is consumer discretionary. That's in the number two spots. That's where you have Amazon and Tesla. And Let's get a quick look and see how these stocks are doing. We have most of the mega caps in here, not Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, we'll see if we have time for that in a second. But NVIDIA up about 2%, Alphabet down 1.67%. So Alphabet bucking the trend. But I mentioned Tesla, that's up about 1%. And let me just get to some comments uh, in about the S&P 500, about the market overall. Uh, Maddie was just quoting Ryan Dietrich. And there are a lot of studies out there. Uh, for instance, we are just about to have our fourth month in a row that is up. And just taking a look, uh, here's Wayne Whaley breaking it down. 25 and 0 for the next year when December, January, and February are each positive. All right, there are a lot of ways to slice this and dice this. We have another one from Steve Depp right here. Not going to get into the details, but strength begets strength. And another thing I want to point out here, February, on average, losing month, didn't happen. So when uh, bullish seasonality or when seasonality is bucked, I think it's time to pay attention. And there is just not a lot of weakness in this market, is there? It certainly doesn't look like it, at least for now. All right, Jared, thanks so much for breaking that down. Again, now we are looking at gains shortly after the open, all three of the major averages trading to the upside. We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back.
The market rally taking a bit of a breather here shortly after the open as investors look ahead to a very busy week of economic data and also corporate earnings. The S&P 500 and the Dow just hovering shy of those record highs that we talked about last week. Well, can lackluster reports break the market's recent momentum? And what do we all say about where NVIDIA and the AI field rally is headed? We want to bring in Brian Jacobson. He is Annex Wealth Management's chief economist and strategist. Brian, it's good to see you here. So what do you make of this massive move higher that we saw a lot of that on the back of the NVIDIA's blowout quarter last week? Are we set up to maybe see a bit of a correction here on the horizon? Yeah, thanks for having me. We think that actually we might be set up for a bit of a pullback in some of the high flyer names, but not necessarily anything all that broad or all that deep. And when we look at last March, right, it was NVIDIA to the rescue in terms of the AI story, the tech story, and the rally from there. And once again, it was the NVIDIA earnings that really helped kind of turn sentiment around. End of December, things were looking really good. January was beginning to look a little bit uh, chilly for the markets. And then things turned around when we realized that, you know, maybe this whole AI thing does have some legs. But uh, uh, maybe some of the names have been pulled along in the wake of NVIDIA that perhaps shouldn't be. And so we could maybe see a little bit more sifting and winnowing in the markets over the next few weeks. What What is the profile of the companies that you would believe are perhaps positioned to fall off of the NVIDIA coattails then? <laughs> yeah, so a lot of it would really have to do with those who claim to be uh, related to AI, but are only so in name. And I think that's something that you oftentimes see is think about uh, when Bitcoin was on uh, one of its many runs higher, you know, before its precipitous falls, uh, that a lot of companies were talking about blockchain, uh, talking about issuing their own coins. And so when we were actually going through on our investment committee, looking at those word clouds that you can do uh, for earnings transcripts, artificial intelligence began popping up quite often. But then when you look at the company that are actually talking about it, not all of them are actually using it. It seems like, you know, maybe they're just trying to say that they're being very fashionable. So we would just urge caution with a lot of investors that if somebody claims that they are using AI or that they stand the benefit from it, really dig into the details and find out if there's any substance there behind the words. Brian, I also want to bring up what we heard from uh, Berkshire Hathaway over the weekend. They have a record set of cash here, $167.7 billion. You had Warren Buffett warning that there's not many deals out there, that there's no possibility of another eye-popping performance. Is this, I'm curious how you take that into account when you're thinking about what this next several months, couple of years could look like. Those words from Warren Buffett, is that a warning, do you think, to the market? Well, yes, I think it's a warning for the bigger cap companies, because for a company like Berkshire Hathaway, for them to have something that's going to move the needle, some sort of transformational deal, it's going to have to be very big. They're either going to have to have a large deal or a large number of deals. And so for us, it actually seems like maybe more of those transformational deals are going to be more lower cap. So think about mid cap and small cap companies. So for a company like Berkshire Hathaway, where they have, what is it, like $140 billion in cash, it would take quite a large deal to actually improve their return on investment for the next quarter. But if you consider a smaller or a mid-cap company where they don't have you know, billions in cash, where it might be millions instead, some of these deals can be very transformational, very impactful on their businesses. Brian Jacobson, who is the Annex Wealth Management Chief Economist and Strategist. Brian, thanks so much for taking the time this morning. Thank you. Absolutely. Guys, coming up, shares of Domino's or Domino's, little neighborhood joint, rising on earnings, seeing its Uber Eats partnership pay off. We'll speak to BTIG's Peter Salle on those results next. Wow.
Domino shares moving to the upside. Look at that, a jump of just about 8% after reporting a 2.8% jump in U.S. same-store sales from a year ago, boosted by its partnership with Uber Eats. Now, the pizza chain is also doubling down on its loyalty program after grappling with the slowdown in sales at the beginning of last year. For more on these results, we want to bring in Peter Soleil. He's BTIG's managing director and restaurant analyst. It's great to have you here. So let's talk about this strong report here, at least at what it looks like from Domino's. You've got shares hovering right around that two-year high. What do you think this, these results tell us about some of the momentum that we're seeing play out in Domino's business? Great. So thanks for having me on. Yeah, look, I think it was a, it was a good quarter. Um, the, the important points to note here is they beat on same-store sales. Uh, they beat on, on the bottom line. Uh, the same-store sales are being driven by growth uh, and transactions in both carryout and delivery. So both of their biggest segments both drive in positive transaction growth. And this is before, really before the impact of the Uber Eats partnership was really kicked into gear uh, in the new year in, in 2024. So you're seeing an, already an acceleration of same-store sales and traffic uh, and beats on the bottom line before you're getting any benefit from Uber Eats. So I think there's a lot more to come uh, in 2024 as they leverage the Uber Eats partnership. What does it say about the tech dominance that Domino's has really put forward, not just to investors, but to some of those core customers for better part of a decade plus now uh, and the investments that they still need to make to make sure that they kind of continue to maintain that, you know, that particular uh, title, if you will. Yeah, no, they continue to make investments uh, on the digital side as as all restaurants are, are doing going forward. I think Domino's is, uh, digital mix right now is between 80 and 85 um, percent. That, that's best in class. Uh, you, you gather not only are you, you growing sales with more digital sales, because that's how the customer wants uh, to order, but you're gathering a lot of information around the customer, which really informs your advertising strategy, your menu strategy. So uh, it is a very important piece of their business. But like you said, they continue to invest. They'll continue to invest in 24 and 25 uh, and many years beyond as they grow that digital mix and trying to get it to 100%. Peter, a bit of the slowdown that we're seeing in the overseas business, obviously very similar to some of the rivals, some of their competitors out there. How big of a headwind do you see that remaining for as you look ahead to the rest of 2024? Yeah, you know, that, that's hard hard to tell right now how, how big and how long that headwind is going to last. I mean, they, they called out France as, uh, as one of the issues over in Europe and obviously the Middle East. I think they're both related. There's some negative sentiment going on for Western brands. Uh, in, in countries like France right now. Um, we'll see when that turns around. I, I think, you know, obviously the war has a lot to do with it. Really don't know when that's going to turn. I think the story right now for Domino's is really more around <clears throat> the U.S. business uh, and, and the growth that they're seeing there uh, as that's been challenging for the past several years. How much do you think that they still need to insert promotions into the U.S. business strategy, given that consumers are trying to value hack wherever they can right now? So look, they've they've had really strong promotions and really strong value for as long as I can remember. They started with five ninety nine mix and match. Now they're at six ninety nine. Uh, the, their value proposition is very strong. It's more about how aggressive they advertise it. Uh, right now, they're advertising more pan pizza and more bundles. Uh, I think as we go through the year, you'll start to see them pulse back in on the value proposition as well. So uh, I think it's more about advertising, but their value proposition is best in class and will continue to be so going forward. Peter, when it comes to the biggest headwind that you see facing Domino's, obviously inflation has had a real impact on their business. They've been able to offset it a bit uh, in terms of pricing. Is that a strategy that you think is going to continue to be as effective going forward? Yes, inflationary prices are easing just a bit, but the consumer is also being a lot more discerning in terms of how they're spending their dollars. Yeah, so inflation has been a struggle for all restaurants and, and, and Domino's, uh, really some commodity inflation, but also wage inflation. I think the one that lasts, is, continues to last, is, is the wage inflation. They're calling for mid-single-digit wage inflation again in 24. That's on top of significant in 23 and 22. So I look, I think inflation is, gonna, is here, here to stay, uh, but keep in mind if consumers are looking for a value um, and, and ways to leverage their dollars, I, really there is no better way than the pizza category and Domino's is the leader on value. So you can feed a family of four for 25, 30 bucks. Um, you struggle to do that in any other QSR or any other restaurant out there. 
Wawa would say, hold my beer. Peter Salle, thank you so much for taking the time here on the day. Certainly do appreciate it. Talking all things dominant. All right, great. Now I'm hungry again. It's 9.48 a.m. Thanks a lot, Peter. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Thanks. Coming up, BYD's dominance. We'll talk about why the Chinese EV maker doesn't see Tesla as competition after the break. The biggest EV maker in the world, BYD, asserting its pricing dominance in the market, unveiling an ultra-low-cost version of its Dolphin vehicle, coming in at under $14,000, and its luxury supercar topping $230,000. That's quite a spectrum. All in just a couple of days of each other. Our very own Akiko Fujita sat down with the executive vice president of BYD as the company looks to make a bigger push outside of China. Hey, Akiko, tell us what you learned from this conversation. Yeah, Brad, you know, you talk about the lower end and the high end. That scale that BYD has been able to establish really been key to their success. It was just four years ago there were concerns about the company's survival. Now it is the top EV maker in the world, surpassing Tesla in 2023, selling more than 3 million cars. Now, some viewers may remember back in 2011, Elon Musk was asked about competition from BYD. He laughed off the competition then, saying that BYD should be more concerned about survival within the Chinese market. So naturally, that's where I started the conversation with the executive vice president of Stella Lee, asking her how she felt about beating Tesla as the top EV maker in the world. 
We feel like uh, we have a high respect uh, for Tesla. They are marketing leader. They give a great education for the market. Without them, I think uh, the global EV market could not run so rapidly. So we, we respect them a lot. I think they are a partner, and also they are uh, like a, we together, we, we can really help the whole world to educate the market, to push in the market for transaction, mm -hmm. and uh, pushing the, the whole auto industry to transact to the future electric car. What do you tell that driver that, that's looking at these two cars? You're saying that BYD is a tech company. Elon Musk says Tesla is a tech company as well. Yeah. Where the, where, what's the value proposition? What is the BYD car in comparison to the biggest competitor out there, which is Tesla? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I ask our team in China, because Tesla is very successful in China, the overlap for BYD and Tesla customer is less than 15%. Less than 15%. So you can, you can see, like, we don't need even to convince them, because <laughs> we only have an overlap of 15%. All the EV company, we should be, we are the partner. Our com real competition is ice car company. Ice car is not a EV. Mm. Yeah. The more people jump in to produce EV, PHEV, EV, is better for the industry. And now that BYD has captured the largest EV market in the world, they've got their eyes set on global expansion. They've made a lot of headwinds in Latin America, Mexico, a significant market they've got their eyes on. We're going to talk to Stella about much more of that in our 11 o'clock hour, um, including some speculation that BYD is setting up in Mexico for entry into the U.S. She's got a lot to say about that speculation. Uh, we've got the longer cut of our interview coming up with Stella Lee, Executive Vice President of BYD, coming up at 11 a.m. Yeah, Kiko, I'm curious, and not to give too much away about that conversation that you have playing at 11, but in terms of how an American should view this, even if you're an investor or possibly in the market for an EV, if you have a player like BYD potentially coming to the U.S., what kind of pr pressure is that going to put on the traditional automakers, a name like Tesla, and also some of the other smaller players within the EV space. Yeah, well, BYD and Tesla have been going head-to-head -head in the Chinese market already, but Stella Lee makes it pretty clear BYD is not looking to play in the U.S., at least for now, because, in her words, things are too complicated, including the politics at play. You've heard a lot of car makers out there, the executives flagging this competition coming in from China. In terms of how investors should be looking at it, we've heard everybody from Ford's Jim Farley to analysts talk about the the cost advantage that BYD has, roughly 30% when you think about where American car makers are competing. Of course, BYD would say, look, we're not a cheap car manufacturer anymore. We are competing on tech and innovation head to head with Tesla. But don't expect BYD in the U.S. market just yet. They say that is not their priority right now. All right, Akiko, thanks so much for bringing us a part of that conversation. Of course, stay tuned here to Yahoo Finance. Akiko is going to be bringing us the full conversation with BYD Executive Vice President Stella Lee. That's at 11.15 a.m. Eastern Time today. Well, coming up, we will be taking a closer look at some of the housing data that's crossing the wires in just a few minutes. New home sales will bring the latest on that. What that tells us about the broader housing market next.
Hey, welcome back to Yahoo Finance, everyone. Happy top of the 10 a.m. hour to you. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. We're about 30 minutes into the trading day. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up. Stocks muted this morning as investors await new inflation data in the coming days, and that's going to test the staying power of the breakout rally that followed NVIDIA's results. You're taking a look at the S&P 500 on your screen, flat just barely to the upside right now. Let's also get to some individual movers that we're watching here this morning. Shares of Danish pharmaceutical company Zealand Pharma surging this morning as the company reported strong results from a trial of its liver disease treatment that has been touted as a potential competitor in the weight loss drug market. The drug has received fast-track designation from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And Gap moving higher this morning, just up about, well, 2.7% after J.P. Morgan upgraded the apparel retailer from underweight to neutral. The analyst behind that call also raising his price target on Gap from $16 to $20. In the note, J.P. Morgan highlights Old Navy's operations and improvements in its inventory levels. And Fresh Pet shares are surging after beating expectations for revenue and profit in its fourth quarter. The pet food maker also issuing a strong guidance as it sees a surge in volumes. That's thanks in part to higher media spend. All right, we got some breaking news out on new home sales just crossing the wires minutes ago, coming in less than expected. When you take a look at new home sales, actual number here at 661,000, that was lower than what the street had been uh, looking for here. The prior estimate was also revised a lower to 651,000 now month on a month, month over month basis. You're looking at an uptick of one and a half percent here. The survey had been looking for a jump of a three percent. So missing the street's expectations here. So again, the results not as strong as what had initially been anticipated heading into this report. So again, just another sign here, Brad, that the housing recovery is taking even longer to play out. Yeah, and as we look through this data just a little bit more here, one of the other things, the median sales price of new houses mm-hmm. sold 2024 for, well, in January 2024, $420,700. Average sales price was $534,300. Just imagine if it was only $534. My goodness, we'd all have about five or six or seven homes. Anyway, when you think about some of the other factors that are really playing into this and the areas where we're continuing to see homes really uh, dove into, it's, it's going to come on the back of still this mortgage rate environment here. And consumers, any Anyone who's looking at a home, especially according to some of the Freddie Mac data that we had seen come forward last week with regard to the existing home sales print, that Freddie Mac data looking year over year, and there you're taking a look at the 30 versus the 15 uh, right now, it's still going to need to trickle a little bit lower for some of those potential sideline consumers to really uh, full-throatedly throw some, some bids out there into this market as well. Yeah, certainly. Again, the new home sales rising 10,000 in January from the prior month, lower than what the, than what forecasters have been anticipating he- heading into that report. But you're right to point out price there, Brad. The median new home price falling 2.6% year-over-year basis to 420700 The average selling price, though, still above 530000 yeah. Absolutely. Well, new home sales are out this morning and falling to 661,000 for January compared to 664,000 in December. This comes as inflation remains sticky in the sector. Mortgage rates remain close to 7%. Let's bring in Lawrence Yoon, who is the National Association of Realtors Chief Economist, to discuss more. Lawrence, great to have you here with us. You had some big data last week. This week, we get this data. And today, from the Census Bureau, I just want to get your read on the broader kind of mix within this housing market and comparing this new home sales number to what we're seeing in the existing home sales prints? Uh, Well, uh, it's showing uh, that the housing sector is super sensitive to small changes in mortgage rate in the current environment. Uh, Maybe people witnessed the 8% mortgage rate last October and then saw almost 6.5% late last year and in January. Now uh, rates rising. Uh, This is beginning to pull back. The new home sales, which were contract signing uh, in the figure, so super sensitivity among consumers to mortgage rates. Lawrence, we also had existing home sales rising just a smidge, though, to start the year. So, yes, the tick up in new home sales wasn't exactly as high as the street had been forecasting, but we are edging, I guess you can say, in the right direction. Does this at all point to maybe a more positive, slightly stronger housing market that we could expect in 2024? I mean, there is definitely a large degree of pent-up demand 
along with even delayed sellers, uh, sellers who have life-changing circumstances, having additional child in the family, maybe a retirement age, maybe a new job uh, that requires different commuting patterns. So all these uh, delayed sellers are waiting for the rates to drop before listing their home, along with many buyers, uh, because the home sales closing activity is reflecting the interest rate of what was occurring in December. Again, it was lower, but now uh, here in late February, higher mortgage rate beginning to bite into some of the contract signings for new home sales. But let's also uh, keep in mind that new home sale had their third best year uh, since the foreclosure crisis of 2008, just last year. So this is clearly implying that there is a demand if inventory is available. What does this mean in this interim period of time about some of the home improvement projects that, that people might even take on? And we think through to how some of our viewers may be receiving this data and how it passes through to some of the, the stocks that we track, whether that be Home Depot or Lowe's or, you know, even the home builders out there and Toll Brothers, Lennar and so forth, where there, there's going to be this concerted focus on where, if you're not getting back into the housing market right now, where you are spending to perhaps enhance your own home ownership experience. Uh, you know, uh, multiple offers are still happening on those mid-price home and below. And also, uh, it's a very good thing that the builders are beginning to focus more on the mid-price home rather than those expensive McMansions. So the median prices have actually come down, uh, reflecting the builders focusing on more smaller size home. Uh, so that's a very good sign, and that's where the demand is heaviest. But the fact that there are multiple offers on the existing homes uh, is important implying that not all demand is being satisfied. We need more inventory, and certainly builders are helping on that inventory front slowly. Is 2024, from your outlook, going to be the year where millennials are able to really fully throw pitches out there or even get into, as you mentioned, some of those mid-tier price new homes that are in construction? Um, I think 2024 will certainly be better than last year. Uh, the mortgage rate overall environment, even though there is week-to-week fluctuation, uh, should be lower, measurably lower this year compared to last year. And again, that super sensitivity, mortgage rate comes down. Uh, we have rush of buyers going into the market. Uh, we just need to assure that there's more supply, especially at the local government level, whether it is uh, trying to assure that there is no uh, overly burdensome regulation regulation that prevents builders from getting into the market, uh, maybe looking at some of the zoning regulations, but we need to assure that more supply come onto the market, and that's how one makes the millennial generation, younger uh, adults, to have a better chance at ownership opportunity. Lawrence, when it comes to the builder incentives that have been offered, one of those obviously being the mortgage uh, rate buy-downs, how likely is it that those incentives are going to be around or here to stay for at least the next couple of quarters? Uh, you know, the builders are using all the uh, potential attraction to get the buyers. Uh, they are saying to uh, the realtors, bring your buyers, we will pay you a commission. Uh, and, they, you know, the buyers are also getting the attractive buy down on the mortgage rate, uh, even with some price discount. But the builders are also doing very well in terms of their profitability. So even with these incentive, one looks at the profits or even the stock prices of the publicly listed companies, home builders. Uh, they have have done exceptionally well the past two years, indicating that there's plenty of demand. The builders need to keep up ramping up production, ramping up production, uh, because they are able to make those sales even with some incentives and price discounts. Do, so should prospective buyers count on more incentives to enter into the market? Uh, you know, but the buyers uh, should be negotiating hard, especially on the new homes where the inventories are plentiful uh, by this segment of the market. But on the existing home, uh, it is the sellers who have still have the edge over the buyers. So one walks around the established neighborhood, those are existing home. But if one is looking at new subdivision with a construction crane, uh, maybe that's where the better bargain opportunity is available for buyers. All right, Lauren Jean, always great to get your perspective here. National Association of Realtors, a chief economist. Thanks. Thank you.
Let's take a look at Ethereum. We have certainly seen a rally play out now well above a 3,000, crossing above that 3,100 level. Jared Blicker has a closer look at this rally that we've seen and exactly, I guess, why we're seeing this rally and what this could mean here for what's ahead, Jared. Yeah, sometimes it's difficult to tease out the catalyst and the true meaning uh, and origins behind these moves. But one of the reasons, uh, so two things happen happening, actually. There is a spot Ethereum ETF. There's lots of hype around that, very similar to the Bitcoin spot Bitcoin ETF, but there's also an upgrade scheduled for Mar March 12th. Uh, it's Denkin upgrade, and that's supposed to make it more uh, quick, uh, more uh, compatible, uh, actually more um, faster with respect to Solana. I guess that's the word I was looking for. I do find it interesting that over the last three days, Ethereum has been up 4.1%, while Solana competitor is down about seven tenths of a percent. So I think, Shauna, that actually gives some weight to that potential argument that this is in fact about the upgrade. But let's take a look at the price action. This is over the last three days. We actually punched above 3,000 a few days ago over the weekend. And let me just show you a five-year view so we can see those record highs right around 5,000. Now, as it happens, a lot of times uh, when we don't have a lot of price history, we've just gone straight up. Sometimes it pauses at these big psychological levels. 3,000 was a level. 3,500 is a level right here. 4,000 is a level. So we'll have to watch these as we keep uh, heading higher here. But it looks like there's a lot of fuel in the tank for crypto. We have the Bitcoin halvening. Now, that's Bitcoin, not Ethereum. But there's it does uh, create a lot of excitement around uh, Bitcoin and crypto in general when we have these halvenings. And that's going to happen in April. Every time that's happened before, that has kicked off a crypto super cycle. So we could be in store for that as well. And since I mentioned Solana, even though it's a laggard over the last few days, here's a look at Solana over the last five years. This was an even more parabolic chart that we saw a couple of years ago in its rise. But I'm checking out this consolidation here. And let me put a three-month chart on. This is a pretty tight formation. And I got to think, with, the price, uh, with price coming off of these lows very quickly and then taking a few months to regroup, that only makes it more likely that whatever we launch beyond this point, that this will be used as a support base. So for instance, if we were able to launch up here, come back down, these levels right in here around 100, 105 should theoretically act as support. Guys? All right, Jared, thanks so much for breaking the down. Certainly seems like, at least for now, the crypto bull market getting just a bit wider. Well, coming up, global tech leaders are all meeting in Barcelona for the Mobile World Congress, now the biggest mobile event in the world. We are going to be speaking with Qualcomm's chief financial officer and chief operating officer when we come back.
Qualcomm unveiled a new suite of AI, 5G, and Wi-Fi devices at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona on Monday. The chip designer saying its latest innovations will jumpstart a new era of intelligent computing and consumer experiences. For more on Qualcomm's tech enhancements here, I'm joined by Akash Palkiwala, who is the Qualcomm Chief Financial Officer and Chief Operating Officer. Great to grab some time with you, and, and thanks for joining us from Barcelona. You know, first and foremost, we got to know, when you make some serious announcement like this about an AI hub and some of the other language learning models that are really going to be put forward here by Qualcomm. You know, where does generative AI sit in the pillars of the Qualcomm growth targets that you've set forth? Yeah, so first of all, thanks for having me. Excited to, to be here and talk about uh, all the great uh, things we have going on at Qualcomm right now. Um, the AI hub we're particularly excited about because uh, it is something that addresses all kinds of AI models as generative AI models, but simpler AI models as well. And the idea is there's one simple place that all our developers can go to on the web. And it's something that's accessible uh, from Hugging Face and GitHub as well. And while they go there, they can take any of the models that are available. We have a curating of more than 75 uh, language models that are available uh, on, the, on the website. And you could take those models, build it into an application, test it on a device, and deploy it into an application store all in one go right at the website. So it just makes it very easy uh, for the AI developers to take advantage of the hardware that, that we've put forward. And we're excited that this uh, um, broadens the reach of our products and it makes it very easy for developers to access them. I mean, it's so interesting because AI chip demand has really been what's propelled so much of the semiconductor industry over this past year. When is LLMs, when are LLMs, the, the language learning models that really drive these applications, going to have their critical mass moments that companies like yourself at Qualcomm see the benefits of? I think you're already seeing the benefit of large language models on, uh, on data centers. We've seen this uh, show up in the financial performance of some, some of our peers. I think what's going to happen next is these models are going to be deployed on edge, on devices at large scale. And this includes not just phones, but PCs and automotive and IoT devices. And that's a tremendous opportunity for Qualcomm. As these uh, models get deployed in these devices, our chips will be at the forefront, making these deployments very easy uh, for developers, for consumers and bringing some incredible new use cases uh, for the consumers to enjoy. Certainly, so from that mindset and perspective, does it, does it feel like generative AI is really going to supercharge the next smartphone super cycle, perhaps? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think uh, if you look at the smartphone market, what happens is every time there is a new technology that comes in, it drives an expansion in the market. And so generative AI, we are seeing tremendous traction uh, across all the major OEMs, uh, all the uh, content uh, content companies are looking at how to take advantage of it. And there's several examples of use cases that the consumers, I think, are going to find extremely interesting. So we're excited uh, about what it does to the phone market. We're excited about what it does to several other edge devices that Qualcomm participates in as well. And, and when you think about those devices, you mentioned phones. I mean, will all phones released this year or perhaps next year have some type of AI-enabled chip on them? And, and what does that pass-through as well mean for the revenue and, and the margins at Qualcomm? Yeah, so uh, starting earlier this year, we launched our new chip, uh, Snapdragon 8 Gen 3. And this is a chip that has highly integrated advanced AI capability to run Gen AI models. And so as we go through the rest of the year, we're going to see a lot of our customers new, launch new devices, taking advantage of these capabilities. And uh, that's going to translate into uh, both content, market share, uh, growth for us, and we're looking forward to it. You know, it's been interesting, especially within the broader AI kind of chip and, and AI hype phase that we've seen where it's really just been kind of lighter fluid, not just for the, the stock market that's really latched onto that as a theme. I wonder what you make of it from your perspective and you know where Qualcomm sees itself positioned as part of that. Yeah, I think we're very much at the center of it. As I said earlier, I think you're seeing a lot of the use cases come through for AI on the cloud side at this point. We're seeing that transition over to the device side over the next year and Qualcomm's at the center of making that happen. And we're pulling together the ecosystem right across from developers, OEMs, 
uh, content creators, and then we'll be able to bring all that together to have some great use cases for the consumers. And just lastly, while we have you, we do know that Apple has also uh, said that they're going to essentially continue using your 5G modems until 2027. That's ex an extended timeline here. When you think about that and how that contributes to the bottom line, at least for that interim period of time here, you know, how does that change perhaps the, the margin profile or even the revenue profile from your perspective? You know, I think there's a lot of things that Qualcomm does well, but probably at the top of the list is uh, making 5G chips. We're, we're clearly the leader in performance in making those chips, and you're seeing that benefit come through in our relationship with Apple. There's, they, they're looking for us to supply those chips to them, and we'll continue to maintain the leadership and performance, and uh, looking forward to just being a great supplier to them. All right, I had the great privilege of going to Barcelona for the first time last year. You're out there right now, Akash Pakiwala. Thanks so much for taking some time from what I imagine is a great scene over at Mobile World Congress. Thanks so much, Qualcomm Chief Financial Officer and Chief Operating Officer. Thank you very much, and uh, talk to you soon. All right, talk soon, thank you. Guys, coming up, outlet brand Tanger is doubling down on expansion as consumers search for deals. We'll speak with Tanger CEO next. Outlet brand Tanger is doubling down on expansion with its national portfolio now reaching 40 shopping centers in 2023. The company's fourth quarter net income also jumping nearly 30% from a year ago. For more, we want to bring in Stephen Yaloff, joining us here in studio, CEO 
of Tanger. Steven, it's great to have you in studio with us here for the first time on our new set. Let's talk about some of the trends that you're seeing play out within the industry. We talked to guest after guest who continues to tell us that the consumer is very resilient. It's going to remain that way, even in the face of extremely sticky inflation. Is that consistent with what you're seeing? It is, and we're seeing it both at the cash register, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, we listen to the earnings calls of all the big brands. We have a lot of national brands and publicly traded companies that have do business in our shopping centers, and their outlook seems to be pretty good for next year. So uh, we're, we're very optimistic about 2024, and sales. I mean, you have a lot of that information on what the foot traffic into a lot of these different stores who, who operate within your re retail and real estate properties that, that you put forward and put out there into the market. I mean, when you think about where the consumer is typically kind of going into looking for more value, looking right. for more deals, what are you seeing in, in terms of those flows as well? You know, the big trend coming out of the fourth quarter uh, was apparel, mm. particularly the family apparel brands. You know, brands like Gap and American Eagle and uh, brands, brands that sort of define the category. So that's been, uh, that's, that's a, been a pretty exciting trend for us, particularly because 50% of our portfolio uh, stores are apparel brands. Mm -hmm. But other trends that have still been remain consistent are the athletic footwear brands and the athleisure brands. And there's a lot of other athleisure brands that are getting into the fold now, too, between Athleta and Viore, joining very productive and very successful Lululemon stores. Stephen, talk to us about your expansion strategy going forward, because you guys just did uh, something interesting here just in terms of expanding beyond the outlet strategy, which you're very much known for. Why does that make sense at this time? You know, it's, it's interesting, though. A lot of the retailers that are in the outlets are also in the open air lifestyle centers and, and, the, and the regional malls as well. You know, we've got this ability between the platform that we've built, that's a great operator, marketers, and lease, leasing team that can go out and execute across all those different types of uh, portfolios. Mm -hmm. We like open air. We like the fact that people like to gather. We like the fact that there's a sense of community in our shopping centers. And we're both a local draw as well as a regional draw. We just talked about, you know, Asheville, North Carolina, a new center that we just bought. There's a great local trade in Asheville that shops that center almost as if it's its regional mall. But then again, 12 million people a year come and visit that city. So we're pretty clever in how we go after both the tourist trade mm -hmm. and the local trade and balance both of those things. And so how does that kind of also come back to the, the interest rate environment, too, that we're seeing right now, where it's actually more advantageous perhaps to make a purchase rather than start new construction on something? Yeah, well, you know, the, if you take a look at the three properties we brought online last quarter, we built one in Nashville mm -hmm. and we purchased two, Huntsville, Alabama and Asheville, North Carolina. Purchasing those properties was considerably less expensive than developing from ground up. Look, when we put a shovel in the ground almost two years ago in Nashville, it was a much different economy, a much different market. Interest rates were far lower, labor market wasn't what it was, and logistics obviously allowed us to get the products that we needed in order to put that property together. Things slowed down a little bit. Fortunately, in Nashville, rents, because the city's been booming, rents just seem to grow at the same rate that the cost of construction did, so we were able to maintain our yield. Stephen, we just had a, a full screen up, a graphic showing the occupancy levels that you're seeing here at Tanger. And I bring this up because when we talk about the fact that we are in this high rate environment, the shift maybe that consumers have certainly started to show just in terms of spending more online, they're still though going into stores. I'm curious how that is impacting your occupancy levels and maybe how, if at all, you shifted your strategy in terms of short-term leases versus longer-term leases. Yeah, you know, first of all, I think that the the outlet, I'm sorry, the, the online uh, part of the business, obviously very critical. And I think a lot of the retailers are seeing that there's an, there's an ecosystem that, that where most of these retailers have an online presence, find that when they have a offline or a bricks and mortar presence, the local market does a lot more business. And when that offline store, that bricks and mortar store closes, the uh, online business has a tendency to fall a little bit. I think the customer likes to window shop online. If they can't execute online, I think they like to execute in store, particularly in the apparel categories. And I think that's probably why we're seeing a lot of rise in that category and sales in that category. How do you view experiential as part of the real estate kind of portion that you've got? Because that's where, I mean, and, and I saw a video from this weekend from uh, uh, a Sky Zone, I believe it was, of a future NBA prospect. And it sounds like those are the opportunities that are really going to have families really coming into some of these real estate properties, spending more time there, spending 
spending more dollars as well, uh, whether it's a sky zone or a bowling alley, whatever it may be. Sure. Where does experiential sit with that in, in that? Yeah, I think it's critically important to add that to the mix. You know, you asked about online, and I think that, you know, we're all competing to get the customer off the couch and into the store. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? by having better food offering, by sit-down restaurants, better community space, better amenities, and also that experiential retail or the entertainment venues. Mm -hmm. We've added Dave & Buster's to a number of our centers. Um, Tiger Woods' pop stroke just uh, will accompany us in a number of centers, Nashville and Westgate and Arizona, to name a few. So uh, between that and the outdoor driving ranges that are really hot, you know, I think people will come. Perhaps they're, they're coming for a pop stroke and they'll stay for the shopping. They're coming for the shopping. They'll stay for a pop stroke. It keeps them out. And it keeps them out for, for a day and keeps everybody entertained. All right. Sign both of us up for that. For I was sure. going to say, and the future <laughs> NBA prospect, yes. my four-year-old son. <laughs> well, that, I was going to say, you made his day. Got to show him that little clip later. I, I'm, I'm always <laughs> elevating people's titles here. Thank you so much for taking the time here today. Thank Steven Yaloff, great to see you. Thanks Tank for having me. CEO. All right, guys. And AT&T is looking to get back in the good graces of its customers, offering a $5 credit to those impacted by last Thursday's out Outage, which cut off connection for users for about seven hours across the United States. There you're taking a look at shares. They're down by about 1% here on the day. Perhaps investors just pricing in what this potentially means for the balance sheet. But at the end of the day, uh, I think for AT&T reviewing what took place, and now there are going to be more reviews both at a regulatory level. Um, as you hear some of the senators, they sounded off even last week in the immediate wake of this as well. So uh, more interesting perhaps to see what some of those findings reveal. Yeah, the $5 for outage, obviously they're trying to cut down on the backlash that we saw all over social media, that we saw really across the landscape last week following that outage. They were, though, relatively quick to act in terms of addressing this issue within seven to eight hours, I believe. But now for what it means to the investor and why we're seeing it under just a bit of pressure here today, some of that having to do with the fact that it's not exactly immediately clear how much these credits are going to amount in terms of lost revenue. We had talked to a couple of uh, guests last week here on the program who said that, hey, it doesn't mean mean too much in terms of the longer term 2024 results, but in terms of the, sh the specific quarter here that is playing out right now, it could have a bit of an impact. So exactly how material that is going to be is critical here for investors. But again, you're seeing some pressure, though, across the board, which is also important to point out. You got AT&T off just about 1%, but Verizon, actually the laggard within the space, off just over 2% today. Absolutely. We'll keep tabs on that. Coming up, everyone, the global travel and hospitality industry is finally seeing its long-awaited post-pandemic rebound. We're going to speak with Sebastian Bazin, who is the Accor CEO on what the future looks like for the hotel industry after a tough few years here. Stay tuned.
The travel industry boomed last year, and although consumer spending is expected to slow this year, 2024 should still see good growth for the sector here. Now, one aspect that's coming back stronger than ever, corporate travel. All week long, we're diving into the travel sector as part of Yahoo Finance's Travel Guide 2024 Industry Insights. For more on the future of corporate travel, we've got Sebastian Bazin, who is the Accor CEO, here with us in studio. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me. So what are you seeing right now in your business in the corporate travel rebound that many of the travel executives are, are spelling out to us? Well, I could say I was wrong three years ago. Three years ago, I thought corporate travel was going to go down by 20, 35 percent forever wow. because of Teams, Zoom, ability to work uh, remotely. And I was dead wrong. It's actually back. Uh, it's a different mix. So the international what if executive from Microsoft or Boeing in Seattle probably is going to cut his trip by half if he, if he was to go to Seattle, go to Boston, go to New York, Singapore, because he can actually do it remotely. But because of this ability to work remotely, the same reason makes it that I guess a lot of people don't go back to the office, i.e. for any big companies like Accor to preserve the culture. Then you have, for the last 12 months, an enormous number of small groups 10 or 20 person from the same corporation in 20 different cities when they regroup together for a couple of days just to bond back together. And so as opposed to have international traveler coming alone, we have small groups of companies, people working in different locations, and that is corporate travel. Mm -hmm. So it's a different mix. It's almost back, but with a different kind of actually uh, clientele. You said it's almost back. So I guess what does the level look like compared to 2019? And are we going to get back to 100% of the level that we saw? Pre Again, it's probably going to be vastly different between America and outside of America. So corporate travel in America is 90% domestic. Mm -hmm. For me, corporate travel has a lot to do with international corporate travel. Mm -hmm. So we're probably 10% lower than 2019, mm -hmm. and we're likely going to be probably 3 or 4% up at the end of this year compared to 2019. As you look across your property portfolio right now, where does it make sense to identify more opportunities to add to that portfolio, or, or where are you scaling back right now based on the environment? That well, we're not scaling in? back. Okay. It's, uh, it's still a blessed industry. We're probably going to have all of us, all my peers on our core, a better year in 2024 than we had in 2023. You have a decelerating growth of the price per room, but it's still growing. And I don't know whether it's going to be 2 or 5% this year, but way off from 15 or 20% last year. But you're still going to have a scarcity of supply, new supply coming on. Uh, you still have a large market share for all of us. And two, you have a growing demand. You have a billion five international travelers as of 2019. We're still 3% below 2019. And a part of the billion five, people don't realize. China was 150 million, America 150 million international travelers. But India was only 35 million. And the emerging middle class out of India is going from 300 million to 800 million people the last five years. So you're going to see India going up from 35 million international travelers to 80, 90, 120, matching up with China and the US. That alone has a huge impact on the hotel hospitality in the world. And ACO is probably the best beneficiary of it because they're going to go three or four hours west or east. So they're going to go to Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore. Or they're going to go west. They're going to go to Sub-Saharan Africa, Egypt, and Middle East, where we have the largest market share. Mm. So you're going to have more than a billion five international travelers the next probably two to three years. So demand's probably going to go three, four to six percent compared to three to five percent the last 20 years. Sebastian, when you talk about that uptick in demand, we have outside of the business travel space, we also have a couple of huge sporting events taking place, one of those being the Paris Olympics uh, this summer. How big of a catalyst is that for your industry and specifically for Accor? Not as big as I wish for. It's mm -hmm. probably for our core, it's going to be half a percentage point in terms of ref bar for the year. So it's going to be plus two and a half percent for France. Why is not that much bigger is because in France in July and August, it's pretty robust. Mm -hmm. So they're going to add maybe a 2% occupancy, so you go from 90 to 92%, but it's a bit anecdotal. Mm -hmm. it, does give, it does give a big flashlight on France at the country and destination. That's helpful. But you're going to have the European Soccer Cup in Germany, Austria in June. You're going to have the Olympics in July and August. You're going to have the America's Cup sailing in Barcelona. It's a hell of a good year, actually, for us in Europe right. this year, so, which is remarkable. Just on the, on the labor side as well, how, how have you needed to perhaps moderate how the business operates given some of the higher labor costs as well right now? We've been increasing the low paid salaries, the first entry salary, we've been increasing the salaries quite a bit. And we've been blind for too long actually, not accepting to pay those people more. 
Now, the main reason why people come back to the industry, and funny enough, those are not the guy who left us. It's actually newcomers. Mm -hmm. They're coming back as long as you can actually assure them a sense of purpose, human interaction, caring, emotional. A lot of people are moving away from the media telecom industry because being alone with your headset in front of your screen is pretty boring and depressing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so as long as you can actually show to them that they're going to be able to evolve in their own career and do something, when they actually do something every day, and a lot of it is unforeseen event, it's kind of a fun job. Yeah. Uh, so it's human interaction, uh, which is why I joined this industry from the financial industry. Much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> Much more indeed. And it looks far better, especially when you get out of the office as well here. Sebastian, thanks so much for taking the time here with Thank us. Thank you so much. Sebastian nice. Bazin, who is the Accor CEO. Coming up, everyone, we've got more from Yahoo Finance's Travel Guide 2024 Industry Insights. We'll give you three stocks to watch in the travel sector on the other side of the break. It's been a few years since COVID upended the global travel sector. The world is now largely vaccinated. The recession we were all hoping to avoid didn't happen, and the consumer is still spending. Oh, and the Fed is about to cut rates. So, looks like we're poised for another huge year. Well, maybe. But there are more than a few headwinds to contend with, not to mention trends that could reshape the way that you think about your next vacation. Is Delta the airline best positioned to hold market share? Are cruise lines about to hike prices on a stream of never-ending demand? Is Astro Tourism really the next big hit for 2024? 
And should you really drive your Tesla from LA to San Francisco? Yahoo Finance's Travel Guide 2024 Industry Insights puts you at the center of the story, looking at planes, trains, automobiles, and any other form of transport you can think of. We're diving deep into the travel sector as a part of Yahoo Finance's Travel Guide 2024 Industry Insights. Now, for investors looking to the best way to play the travel sector, I've got three stocks for you to watch as we gear up for those peak travel seasons. First, let's talk a little airlines. Let's go to the skies with the Steel Birds. It's got to be Delta here. Delta is really focused here on international, and that's one of the themes that could really play out here and benefit them. You think back to why City has this as one of their 2024 stock picks for the year here? Well, it comes back to that international travel demand here. And from Ed Bastian, the CEO of Delta, what he's told us in the most recent earnings is what we see in our whole bookings is really more of the same that we've been seeing all year. International bookings and demand looks really strong. That's what he told Yahoo Finance after they reported their most recent quarterly earnings. He also went on to say, so I think we're looking at a very, very strong Q3 as indicated by their guidance and we'll have a strong Q4 as well. And so that is one of the kind of broader lookouts into deep in this year where international travel could play a role. Now, let's also talk about Marriott. Let's go to the accommodation space. This one's going to be in focus and why? Well, it's one of the top picks among analysts who are looking across the accommodations in the hotel industry across the street here. And it has outperformed many of its industry competitors here. But one huge theme to zero in on for Marriott is going to be that rebound in corporate travel that we've been continuing to talk about. With the number of events that are set to be hosted and bookings that come along with those events, Marriott seen as one of the outstanding uh, participants or performers within that market here, especially as compared to some of its other peers here as well, even though one of the others also having a good year to date that's Hyatt. So keep close tabs on them. They're up by about 15 percent. And lastly, let's go to the high seas here, if you will, where you'll find perhaps Captain Jack Sparrow and a few of his other friends. Let's go to the Caribbean, Caribbean, whatever you're calling it, Royal Caribbean, ticker symbol RCL. That is really have, having a focus on these new fleets, and that could potentially pull forward some bookings here. And so if you think back to the earnings call that this company just had, they expect to grow capacity by the introduction of the Utopia of the Seas and Silver Ray in the first full year of service of the three incredible ships that joined their fleet during 2023. The Icon of the Seas, Celebrity Ascent, and Silver Nova, the new ships not only elevate their vacation experiences, they said, and draw new customers to their brands, but they also provide yield tailwinds, they said on the call, enhancing overall profitability. And in 2024, they expect yields to grow five and a quarter to seven and a quarter percent driven by the performance of their entire fleet. So whew, that is all that we're going to be tracking, at least in these three stocks here. And we'll see how those themes play out for Marriott, Delta, and Royal Caribbean. All right, Brad, thanks so much for breaking that down. Certainly three names we got to keep on our radar here for the coming months. Well, let's talk a little bit more about what we're seeing from the consumer, because can that strong consumer that reignited the revenge travel surge in 2023 still keep the economy afloat? Now, recent quarterly results from Expedia, Airbnb, Booking.com, just to name a few, pointing to a moderation in consumer spending. Now, this comes as Americans pull back on their discretionary spending. So what does that tell us about the consumer and more broadly speaking about the economy? Joining us now as part of Yahoo Finance's Travel Guide 2024 Industry Insights is Ian Shepardson. He's Pantheon Macroeconomics founder and chief economist. It's good to have you here. So let's talk about just what you're seeing, the trends that you're noticing from the consumer, because we spent months and months and months talking about the fact that nothing is prompting Americans, consumers to really pull back on spending. Yeah, we're starting to see that shift just a bit. Yeah, I, I like the word moderation. I think that's a pretty fair description of what's likely to happen over the course of this year. Yeah, there's a couple of things to think about. First of all, there's just a bit less cash flow around for the consumer than there was uh, last year. You know, we've got slightly slower payroll growth, slower wage growth. Um, we've got a much smaller annual uplift of Social Security payments this year, which gave 70 million people last year an 8.7% pay increase in January. This year, it's 3.2. And then on the balance sheet side of the consumer story, there's a lot less savings hanging around that was built up during the pandemic. And if you look at the distribution of where that money is still sat, it's almost entirely in the hands of the top 20%. 
most households now don't have any of the pandemic savings still remaining. So they can't spend it again. They've spent it once, they, they can't do it again. So I think that suggests maybe a dichotomy where if you're at the top end of the business, the travel, the leisure sectors, and maybe even in terms of goods as well, your customers still have money. But most households, by definition, are not in the top 20%. Uh, and they're going to find things much more difficult. They're going to be relying on cash flow rather than savings. And they've got a lot less cash flow than they did. So I can see that bifurcation. And in the mass market, yeah, I think the moderation will become quite visible over the next few months. And, and so how does that flow through to some of the companies that we were just laying out here? Where perhaps in that discretionary spend here on the experience economy and in that travel experience, are you seeing consumers at least think about perhaps trading down? Yes, uh, trading down, but at the very high end, I think uh, things are going to be fine. You know, the, the, the stock market is, uh, has, has boomed over the last few months, uh, and a lot of the people in the top 20%, especially the 1%, are still holding on to huge gains, both in cash and, and other less liquid assets that they, they've accumulated over the last few years. It's more the kind of middle and, and lower end of the market that's, I think, going to be struggling for occupancy or for uh, people's willingness to spend on extras. You know, all the trading up that we saw in that sort of post-pandemic surge of the of the revenge spending in restaurants and leisure activities and concerts and movies and all that sort of stuff. You know, I, I, at the margin, I would expect that the, the extra dollar that we were seeing over the last couple of years just not to be there to quite such a, a same extent. Now, I don't want to overdo this. I'm not looking for the consumer to roll over at all. Uh, but, you know, real income growth after tax last year grew by more than 4%, which is almost double the long run average. There was, a, there was a lot of money around. This year, it'll be more like two, which is a little bit below the long run average. So not terrible. But I think if anyone's you know, in the consumer facing world, just extrapolating what they saw in 23 and hoping to get a repeat performance in 24, that, that's going to be a struggle. So, Ian, as we have consumers pushing back on higher spending, consumers trading down in some instances, what do you think that tells us then about that last mile fight here to ease inflation? Are, in fact, we going to see maybe inflation continue to ease and that last mile won't be as tough as maybe some forecasters had initially anticipated? Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of hysteria over one not great inflation print for January. But if you look at the performance over the second half of last year, the core PCE deflator, which is the number the Fed really cares about, that was 2% annualized in the third quarter and 2% annualized in the fourth quarter. I mean, that's the target rate. So we've made an enormous amount of progress, and I'm not really worried that it's going to be difficult to keep it uh, down at that rate in the, you know, in the foreseeable future. Yeah, you get bad months. You might even get a bad quarter. But the big picture is, I, I think, one of, of much less pressure across supply chains. We're not seeing expanding margins like we saw in, in 22, 23. And in some sectors, margins have come down quite a lot. That's why uh, used car prices are falling so fast, because dealers' margins have dropped very sharply. And I think we'll see that spreading across more sectors as consumers, again, make that marginal decision with the extra dollar to keep it rather than to spend it. So that should keep a bit of a lid on some of the inflation pressure as well. Uh, and across a big array of services is really all about the labor market. And the fact is that wage growth, which was at the peak 6%, is now heading rapidly down to less than 4%. So all of these things are moving in the right direction. Some of it's still in the pipeline rather than in the CPI and the PCE inflation data, but it'll get there. It's just a matter of time. With regard to that, leisure and hospitality was, of course, the hardest hit over the course of the pandemic. And then had some of the biggest comeback that it needed to make as well in the labor and in employment situation. Where are we starting to see that normalize? Oh, I mean, I think you can see pretty clearly that, that that total frenzy of rehiring that we saw beginning in the summer of 21 and stretching really right the way through uh, 22, that's pretty much over now. And what's interesting is that you can see that in the way that employees are behaving, because what we saw in 21 and 22 was a huge increase in the number of people voluntarily quitting their jobs just so they could walk across the street to a different hotel or a different restaurant and pick up a pay raise. Great. Why wouldn't you do that? And we saw that behavior on a scale that we've never seen before uh, in 21 and 22. And now it's back to normal. You know, so the, the quits rate, which is the official measure of this behavior, is now exactly where it was in 2018-19. And we know that the number of job openings is declining pretty steadily. 
Uh, and we know that wage growth is slowing as well. So we've got a fairly uniform picture here of a labor market that's beginning to look recognizably normal, uh, you know, looking back at the pre-pandemic period. And in that pre-pandemic period, we did not have an inflation problem. In fact, most of the 10 years running up to the pandemic, we were fretting, the Fed was fretting, that inflation was too low. Um, I'm not suggesting we're immediately going to go back to inflation that's too low, but I, I do think we're heading back to the conditions where, where getting to the target and staying there is a, an entirely sensible forecast at this point. Ian Jepperton, uh, really interesting insight. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us here this morning. Pantheon Macroeconomics founder and chief economist. Thanks so much, Ian. All right, well, let's do a quick check of the markets. Just about 90 minutes into the trading day. You're still looking at a bit of a mixed picture. You've got the S&P just below the flat line, the Dow just above, and the NASDAQ up just about two-tenths of a percent. Many investors out there trying to figure out whether last week's AI-fueled rally, whether or not that momentum is going to continue to carry into this week. And, Brad, we've got a lot of critical econ data points on deck, as well as some uh, interesting corporate earnings results that we will be hearing from that's going to give us a better idea of the consumer and also strength in tech. Yeah, indeed. And so as we round out the first 90 minutes of trade here on the day, taking a look at some of the sectors as well, pulling up, with, uh, pull, uh, yikes, pulling up the caboose, you've got utilities here. It's down by about 1.7%, but leading the pack here is energy. Stop laughing at me like that. Consumer discretionary is also up by about half a percent right now here. That does it for myself, Brad Smith, and Shauna Smith and the rest of the crew, at least here for today's show. We'll see you tomorrow, Tuesday.
welcome to Yahoo Finance. It is 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Akiko Fujita, and here's what I'm watching this hour. Stocks searching for direction this morning as investors look ahead to key economic data this week, with the Fed's preferred inflation gauge on tap for Thursday. And plugging in BYD, setting its sights on the global market after passing Tesla as the top car maker. My conversation with BYD's executive vice president, Stella Lee, is coming up this hour. Why she says the U.S. is not in play. Plus, the countdown is on. A government shutdown deadline looms yet again as lawmakers remain at an impasse five days away from the funding deadline. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer saying House Republicans need more time to sort themselves out. First, though, as always, let's take a look at where major indices are trading. 90 minutes into the trading day, the S&P 500 dipping just slightly in the red, but it is trading pretty flat there. The Dow up 17 points and the Nasdaq up 22. Certainly investors looking to see if this rally can continue. On the back of NVIDIA's earnings last week, remember, it was all AI really boosting these indices to record levels last week. But of course, key economic data coming through this week. Let's take a look at where Treasury yields are trading as well, because we have seen those yields pushing higher today, the 10-year yield at 4.28%, the 30-year yield at 4.39%. Well, stocks searching for direction with investors focused on key economic data this week. The latest print from the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, PCE, is out Thursday. It is expected to test new records in stocks, which of course were fueled by the AI rally. Here now with the latest broader market action is our very own Jared Blickery. Jared, what do you have your eye on this morning? You know, lots of records around recently, but it's important to break down exactly where we're seeing some of the strength. And today we've got a mixed market. I'll get into uh, the particulars in a second. Just want to point out the S&P 500 underwater a little bit. And then in Europe, also a mixed market. They're going to close in about 30 minutes, a little bit less than that. Paris, the CAC 40, down about 44 basis points. London underwater by a quarter of a percent. While in Frankfurt, the DAX is up by about 12 percent. Now, let's take a look at the sector action. Consumer discretionary is now in the lead. Energy number two, tech number three. Uh, Tech was not even in the top five sectors last week. NVIDIA grabbed a lot of headlines, but actually it was not the best week for tech, especially in software. Uh, Today, I'm seeing a slightly different view. Uh, We do see Microsoft in the red, but we sort by performance, we can see about three quarters of the issues are in the green. Palo Alto Networks taking the lead there of 9%. And then looking at the semi Semiconductor space, a lot more green than red. It looks like analog devices down just a smidge, but uh, also taking a look at unprofitable tech. This is this was really stumbling last week, and I think it says a lot that it is doing well today. Robinhood up 4%, Coindesk, uh, excuse me, Coinbase up 10%. That's on the Ethereum strength that we were talking about in the last hour. But Tesla itself, the behemoth in this group, up about 3.5%. Now, when we take a look at China, we see a little bit of weakness here. Uh, we we did see some strength in fits and starts over the last couple couple weeks, looking for potential stimulus, but not a whole lot of upside action over that time period. We are seeing Lee Auto, that's up 15% today, uh, but not too many other outliers. <laughs> when we take a look at the leaders here, uh, dominated by crypto, so Bitcoin prices grabbing the lead there, up almost 4% as expressed through a couple different ETFs. I mentioned the disruption trade, ARC is up 2.5%. IPO software, chip stocks, and small oil. Uh, that's an interesting uh, ETF that we have here. Let me just take a one-year view, and we can see in small oil energy ETF, PSC, PSEE, we can see that's just roughly trading sideways there. I do want to get in on the bank action. We've seen financials. Uh, they're actually the third best performing sector of the year. Today, not a lot of outperformance. We're seeing some of the majors here like JP Morgan and Bank of America slightly in the red. UBS looks like an outlier. Over in Europe, it is up 1%. Okay, Jared Blickery kicking things off with the latest moves so far in the session this week. Thanks so much for that, Jared. Well, markets are flat as investors look ahead to a busy week of economic data and corporate earnings. Momentum slowing after a record-breaking week for markets last week, led, of course, by NVIDIA earnings. Our next guest thinks it may be time to lighten up on the sector. To break this all down for us, we have Gary Schlossberg, Wells Fargo Investment Institute Global Market Strategy here. Uh, Good to talk to you today. You know, let's kick things off with economic data this week because yes, we've got durable orders, we've got wholesale inventories, consumer spending, but it feels like so much of the market direction is going to hinge on what we get in that PCE data. 
What are you expecting? Yes. Well, we're expecting a, a slight uptick in the monthly number that could uh, drive the year-over-year -year number up just a bit, just adding to the concern that that momentum behind this inflation that we've seen over the past 12 to 18 months is winding down. We saw that with the CPI, and the concern is that tomorrow's, that Thursday's PCE data could reinforce that view. And you've highlighted specific concern here as it relates to the inflation data, that there is a big gap between the year-on-year -year comparisons of core P or CPI, core PCE. Um, why do we see such a, such a wide divide there? Uh, a lot of it has to do with the way the indexes are put together, the way housing costs are measured uh, and the like, uh, the way medical care costs are treated uh, similar in the PCE deflator to the uh, wholesale price number. The two have uh, uh, diverged a bit this year, the PCE deflator generally running below that CPI number. And of course, the PCE deflator is important because that's the favored inflation measure by the Federal Reserve. But the direction, the trend that we're seeing in each, the trajectory of each seems to be flattening out a bit. And uh, that's of concern to the market, regardless of the inflation measure you look at. Gary, we are, of course, coming off of uh, what was a really incredible week fueled by NVIDIA's earnings. Um, you know, at least for the week being, it, it did feel like, given NVIDIA's numbers in the late or latest numbers in the quarter, that a lot of the gains that we have seen in the stock, investors could justify. How concerned are you about the froth that's building within the AI space, or, or, or is it froth? Is it justified, backed up by the numbers? Well, the market may be getting ahead of itself. Clearly, there are tremendous opportunities in the AI area. But as we've seen with technology in the past, we have had uh, the market run ahead and then go into something of a correction. And the timing and the extent of that correction could depend on what the Federal Reserve does, what the economy does. And for that reason, we're more guarded on technology. Uh, we've uh, pulled back a bit. We're neutral toward that sector of the market. Uh, we're more favorable toward energy, healthcare, uh, industrials, uh, and, uh, and materials and the like for a variety of reasons. But our big concern is that um, tech has benefited to some extent by very easy financial conditions, which are becoming less so and could continue to tighten up if, in fact, uh, the view on Fed policy turns a bit less sanguine over the next several months. Gary, you mentioned energy it is one of the positions or one of the sectors you're more favorable in. What do you like specifically there? Well, we think fundamentally the market is tight. Our uh, real asset strategist, John LaForge, feels that we're in the beginning or early stages of a, a, a commodity super cycle, which extends not only to energy, but also to uh, other commodities. And that fundamental tightness means that uh, energy prices, we think, uh, are biased to the upside, both near term and out over the longer term, uh, just given certain supply constraints, greater OPEC plus discipline. Uh, and for that reason, we view that sector more as favorably. Of course, a lot depends on the extent of any future global economic slowdown. But at the moment, we think the supply demand balance favors that sector of the market. Uh, Gary, you are, of course, looking globally, not just in the U.S. We did get that annual letter out from uh, Warren Buffett over the weekend, uh, really sort of reinforcing uh, where he stands on at least Japanese um, firms, the trading firms specifically. We saw the Nikkei hit a record last week. What's your exposure like to that market right now? And how much longer do you think this can continue in terms of the upside? Well, we tend to be exposed more in terms of broad regions, developed markets, emerging markets. We don't typically focus on a, a single market with the exception, of course, of the U.S. Uh, as far as Japan goes, though, we do look at the economy. The economy uh, uh, is struggling a bit, but the export sector is benefiting from a, a relatively cheap yen. Certainly, Japan is sensitive to conditions overseas. But while the Bank of Japan maintains a very accommodative policy stance, that provides an important tailwind, we think, for the Japanese market, contributing to the rally that we've seen, importantly, to the rally that we've seen over the past year. 
It's been incredible to see that run up there. Gary Schlossberg, Wells Fargo Investment Institute Global Market Strategist. Good to talk to you on this Monday. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Well, coming up, BYD says it's not betting on the U.S. EV market. Find out why from the company's executive vice president, Stella Lee. I'm going to bring you my conversation with her on the other side of the break. We'll be right back. The world's top EV maker, BYD, unveiling its ultra-luxury sports car overnight. The U9, sold under its Yang Wang brand, comes with a hefty price tag of $233,000 in China. It is the latest offering from a car maker that's aimed to compete at every price point. A strategy that helped the company top Tesla last year is the largest EV maker in the world. I sat down with BYD's executive vice president and CEO of BYD America, Stella Lee, to talk about the company's evolution and the key markets the firm is aiming to compete in outside of China. I, I think every country besides the U.S. is, a, is a, we saw the trend is almost duplicate the story of China in the past 10 years. Like, a, for example, in Brazil, BYD into Brazil one and a half years ago. But then in the beginning of last year, the EV penetration in Brazil is, is less than 1%, it's 0.8%. Mm -hmm. But the, by the December of last year, the EV penetration, penetration is 5.7%. BYD is a big uh, like a contributor there also. We went there, then we start become the, the maybe the top 10, the number 10th, like a largest brand in Brazil with only 
like uh, electric car and the PHEV. So then this kind of story is happening in Thailand and also Israel and also other countries. So we see this kind of story, um, this kind of similar pattern is like a, for the EV adoption, it start with slow, but not jump, and then well, fast growing in every other countries. So you're saying you, you think BYD can compete in all those markets you just mentioned? Yeah, 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 we, we, yeah, for sure. Because the China, Chinese market is the most competitive market. If you are the winner in the most competitive market, why not you cannot win in other market? It's just about the timing issue. Can you keep the cost as low as you have in China as you expand abroad? Because that's been one of the big propositions, right, from BYD is that mm -hmm. you were able to offer a really, really cheap price point for those consumers who are looking to make the transition. Can you keep those costs low outside of China? Yeah, but I need to correct your comment here. So BYD is not only offer affordable price, but we offer most advanced innovative technology there. So you're competing yeah. on innovation, not necessarily yeah. price point anymore. That's the evolution of BYD. Exactly. So we almost everybody in uh, like our consumer recognize BYD is more like a technology company instead of like a cheap car manufacturer. So we are a technology company, plus the car design you see is very stylish and then very modern. As you look abroad, um, mm -hmm. I know BYD has been expanding its, its manufacturing footprint too. You've mm -hmm. announced a factory in Hungary, mm -hmm. um, one in Thailand. Yeah, the it, Thailand one will start operation by, end, by mid, uh, end of June. How long until you have a factory in Mexico? Um, we, uh, we have manufacturing, we already officially start manufacturing, uh, building the facility in Brazil. So we are now have a team to invest in where the location to set up a Mexico manufacturer. So maybe by second half of this year, we can officially announce our plan to invest in Mexico. So you'll make but, uh, the announcement in the second half of this in year? In the second half. But, but uh, our target is that we build a facility in the south or central re region. Our target is to build this facility only many support Mexican market. It's not to build that Mexico. Uh, it's, a, it's not to build that manufacturer to support U.S. We're not planning to come to U.S. No yeah. plans to come to no, the U.S.? No, no, no. Why not? It's a, too complicated. It's, a, it's an interesting market, but it is very complicated if you're talking about EV. And then, and uh, I think uh, the U.S. market is a little bit slow down on electrification, and uh, a lot of uh, confusing, also very complicated. So we think, well, no, let's 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 hold. We don't we don't have plan to come to U.S. The politics are complicated. Everything is complicated. Politics complicated. Charging for social complicated. And then the it's confused for consumer, and then they they don't know which to choose. So then I think, uh, what do you mean when you say it's confusing for the consumer? Here in US is you have too many confusing noise, speech from different politics. Then this can bring a lot of confusing to consumer and also to auto manufacturing. They are not eager to invest. Um, you don't think they're eager to invest? No, because I read the news, always say, oh, this now this company hold their investment on EV, that company hold their investment on the like a battery manufacturing. Mm. A lot of uh, topic, we don't know what's happening. But in China, the message is strong. If you are not investing for electric car, you are out. You will die. You have no future. So let me challenge you on that bit, because I, I think the White House would argue Yes, China has had a lot of success on EVs. Mm -hmm. We are trying to accelerate this adoption to going electric. You've got the Inflation Reduction Act that does mm -hmm. put forward incentives. It does put forward subsidies as well. Mm -hmm. When you think about where China is right now, what, 35% roughly penetration, right, for EVs versus the U.S., which is at 7%. Mm -hmm. Is the Inflation Reduction Act enough to, to get it to that? Or do you see fundamental differences in the approach between the U.S. and Chinese market in government, in the government push? It's fundamentally different. In, in China, the government will push that uh, like a policy, also will help for the policy. So as long as you uh, produce in China, uh, like a, not produce in China, as long as you produce electric car, then consumer will get a benefit. It's like a give guideline. Then you boost a lot of company to compete. 
But the U.S. policy with IRA, actually, this is uh, have a lot of restriction with the Chinese supplier here. And then this brings a lot of complexity to the current EV manufacturing. As you, you may know, like uh, for the battery technology, for a lot of technology, like China supply chain is a key player. If you trace down all the, from the cell to the raw materials, China like is 70% of the supply chain. But now for ILA, a little bit like a, too complicated to, for any OEM to achieve that like a target. So you're saying so it's, it's not, not a, an all-in approach? It's not all-in. It's not all in. They should be all in, and then they should be open. Remember why US is like a competitive strong? Because we are open market. We welcome everybody to come here to have free uh, competition. And there is uh, like a capital market, right? But now it's become more protect market. Let me ask you this because you say that you have no interest in coming to the US. Mm -hmm. But as you know, mm -hmm. Given your growing presence in Mexico, there's yes. a lot of American car companies that are taking notes <laughs> yeah. saying BYD, Chinese car makers, are mm -hmm. knocking at the door into U.S. entry. And I want to read you a few things that, that we've heard from um, some leaders in mm -hmm. the EV space. Mm -hmm. Elon Musk recently saying that Chinese automakers will pretty much demolish most other car companies mm -hmm. without trade barriers. Those are his words. You heard the Stellantis CEO saying the Chinese offensive is the biggest risk that companies like Tesla and Stellantis face. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you had Jim Farley from Ford recently saying if you can't compete fair and square with the Chinese around the world, then 20 to 30 percent of your revenue is going to mm -hmm. be at risk because of the cost advantage. Uh. Do you agree with that assumption here that if those <laughs> trade barriers aren't in place, mm -hmm. the Chinese can compete fair and square and actually win mm -hmm. this market? Mm -hmm. Uh, so I kind of uh, have a different opinion. First, like uh, for example, BYD invest uh, manufacturing in Mexico is many folks on Mexico market. So that's the reason we are not even consider any Lawson state. A lot of U.S. brand, they all their manufacturing are in the north because it's easy to cross the border. But for BYD, we are more choose looking for the place within 200 kilometers like a radius from the Mexico City. So we are more target of local market, yeah. If, so that's BYD strategy. We, we are not really planning to come to US. So then second, I think uh, this is a similar story if you're thinking about the auto history, maybe 20, 30 years ago, when Japanese came to US, it's the same. Japanese are gonna to kill us, da da da. But in the end, still, we have a, like a local brand. If they participate in competition, they will find a way out. They will be winner. Then any uh, foreigner come from Japan, from uh, Korean, they only share a portion of the business. So that's, I think, for electric car, they are a little bit overreact on the, too, a little bit too scared about the, like a kind of Chinese competition. And, uh, but I, I think it's some kind of a game. You need to either participate or you are behind, you will be out. So the solution doesn't matter. What do you mean by that? You have to participate or you'll be out. Yeah, it's, it's like a, you're talking about in the U.S. market, or you're talking about in general? <laughs> U.S. market, and also some people only focus on U.S. market, give up all other region. Hmm. So like a, a lot of OEM brand here, if they don't participate in the global competition to be better, they will be out. And the, the trade protection will not help you. I never believe like a trade protection will help any company. Yeah, because if you see the who are the winner? Is the company who really change to get all technology will, will be the final winner, yeah. That was BYD's Executive Vice President, Stella Lee, and you can catch our full conversation on our website, yahoofinance.com. Well, coming up, we'll dig into a report that says Americans' financial stress is actually on the decline. More on that after the break.
Well, a new report from Legal Shield points to increased consumer confidence. Overall stress for the American consumer declined more than three points from January's record high, according to the firm's latest consumer stress legal index. But rising bankruptcy inquiries may be signaling a rocky road ahead for the economy. Let's bring in Matt Layton. He's Legal Shield SVP of Consumer Analytics. Uh, Matt, it's good to talk to you. Help us make sense of this. On the one hand, you've got consumers who are saying, hey, I, I feel a little better. But the inquiries point to the fact that things are not that great financially right now. Sure, and thanks for having me today. But before we kind of dive into the numbers, let's talk a little bit about you know what the data is that we have and what gives us the ability to see what's what's coming next. Our our data, the Legal Shield data, the index data, is based on more than thirty five million consumer requests for legal services over the last twenty years. The the index examines findings from approximately 150,000 calls per month from consumers seeking legal help in more than 90 different areas of law. That's 7,000 individual requests per day. This, this provides a unique outlook on consumer actions. They, they call us to improve their standing, to can take control of a stressful situation. And again, these are not opinions or answers to survey questions. People don't call a lawyer for a good time, right? They call a lawyer because they have an issue and they need help. And we've we found that our data is highly correlated with several key economic indicators that includes the conference board's consumer confidence index. And it also gives us a predictive look out into the future on how consumers will be feeling and behaving two to three months from, from now. Our, our volume is such that the so, trends we get from our members reflect the broader trends of consumers across the country. So Matt, if, if, it, if it is forward looking, what does that data tell you about where things are going two to three months from now? And I think you certainly hit it right on when you mentioned bankruptcy. Our flagship index is composed of three individual indices that looks at bankruptcies, consumer finance, and four foreclosures. And I think the story here is that, for, is that bankruptcy data. Um, the bankruptcy index increase for the fifth consecutive month in a, in a row, and it, right now it's at its highest level since March of 2020. What's extremely interesting about this is that our Legal Shield bankruptcy index actually leads the um, bankruptcy filings reported by the U.S. court system by up to two quarters or six months. So we fully believe the increases we're seeing today are going to be su su sustained for at least the next six months. Matt, not sure if you have the avail uh, um, if you're able to really track by sector or, or who's actually you know sort of looking for this legal help as it relates to bankrupt bankruptcies. But based on the data that you have, where is the most pain being felt right now? Well, it's interesting, right? Because we just saw the you know record debt hit seventeen point five in the fourth quarter. Delinquency rates on credit cards increasing, auto loans hitting their highest level since the Great Recession. And you asked the perfect question, right? So we're seeing the Gen X and millennials that are being hit the hardest on these consumer finance issues. These, these younger age co cohorts many times aren't prepared to weather a financial hit or a stressful period as some of the older, more established groups. And really interesting point that we get when we talk to our provider lawyers across the United States and Canada, there are really three prevailing pressures that they talk most about coming from those Gen X and millennial cohorts. And it's that's what's driving consumer stress and an uptick in requests for bankruptcies, repossessions, billing disputes. And that's really credit card defaults. Folks are asking, they're saying, I'm having trouble making my monthly payment and or which credit card should I, should I pay? Aggressive collections. Should I talk to them? Can I negotiate? What happens if I ignore them? And then just overall inflation, right? We're hearing life is just more expensive. And for many people, their, their finances aren't keeping up. Uh, Matt, um, how much of this is exacerbated by the higher rates? I mean, you talk about credit card delinquencies. Certainly, our viewers have seen, you know, those rates are getting higher and higher given the current environment. And we certainly believe that's contributing to what we see here. And again, so calls to our Legal Shield provider lawyers regarding, you know, repossessions again at their highest level since April of 2021, with Generation X and millennials calling at more than twice the rate this January compared to last. And then even when we get, dig a little deeper into billing disputes, 
overall, we're seeing an increase in 53% in those types of calls. But for these younger age groups, those requests are up 96%. So we're definitely seeing consumer stress across the, across the cohorts and across all ages, but really defined by those younger age groupings. Why, why is that? I mean, you talk about the, the, the leanings demographically. Why are we seeing so much stress in that demographic? Yeah, that's a that's a really really good good question. I, I don't know that our our data specifically begins to talk about why that is. I mean, we know that the younger folks, at least as we talk to our provider lawyers, they're really talking to us about you know I'm not prepared enough financially to to weather stress, or I'm not prepared to weather a big hit, or these higher rates for for longer. Matt Layton, Legal Shield SVP of Consumer Analytics. Uh, fascinating data there. Appreciate you bringing that to us. Thank you for having me. Well, lawmakers are warning of another partial government shutdown to come on March 2nd. If no action is taken by that March 1st deadline. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman to get the details. Rick, another potential for a government shutdown. It feels like the market's kind of shrug this off, but... How real is the threat this time around? Uh, I guess it's always real, even though this is the most tedious and infuriating and repetitive thing that we have to um, waste our time talking about. So just to remind everybody who's tuned this out, which is probably everybody, uh, the, the government is cur currently being funded by a set of these temporary spending bills. Uh, and one of them expires on March 1st and another one expires on March 8th. And if those are not renewed in some way, then the government shuts down. So, um, I mean, the story here, again, it's familiar. There's a group of um, super conservative Republicans in the House who are demanding um, all their various priorities attached to these bills, uh, cut funding for this, super strict border mechanism, border control and things like that. And they're just there are no votes. I mean, we have split Congress. You're, you're not going to get everything you want in a split Congress. But these people keep saying, well, then we're willing to shut down the government. So the question is, will they actually do it? I mean, this is a political loser for Republicans. Voters hate it. Um, I think most Republicans realize this would be a dumb thing to do. And they could just do what they've been doing. They could just um, if they can't fund the government for the rest of the fiscal year, they could just do another temporary spending bill. I mean, that's really what is going to happen here. And just to remind everybody, the government's fiscal year starts October 1st. So we're almost halfway through uh, the fiscal year, uh, and we're still talking about how to fund the fiscal year we're in right now. Uh, we're not even talking about what to do for the next fiscal year. I mean, any normal company is now thinking about its budget for the future year. They've already worked it out anyway. I could rant on and on, Akiko. I mean, this is just ridiculous. But here we are once again. Yeah, Rick, I was counting in my head how many times we have seen this, this you know, kick the can down the road. Approach. Too many times. It's pointless. Time. Yeah. Let's talk about what's playing out in the GOP primaries. Of course, the South Carolina primary over the weekend playing out as expected with President Trump winning there. Um, Nikki Haley um, losing funding from a big backer today. What does this ultimately mean? Well, as you said, no surprise. Um, uh, Trump is almost certainly going to be uh, the Republican nominee. Um, so uh, why is Nikki Haley sticking around? I think, uh, for one thing, I think she's kind of like the contingency candidate for Republicans. So if something happens with Trump, like, I don't know, uh, he gets convicted of a crime in one of these four trials uh, that he's facing. Um, and so for some reason, uh, he ends up not able to run. Well, she's standing there as the person who could step in and fill his shoes. Uh, also, I think, uh, you know, Nikki Haley's young enough that she certainly is thinking about 2028. And if she um, goes as far as she can this year, uh, you know, that that's, that puts her in a pretty good, good position for 2028 when I think she's likely to try again. Uh, it does not seem likely she she can't just go on indefinitely, though. You, you need money to run a campaign and donors don't want to put um, put their money into a campaign that is you know clearly not going to be a winning campaign. So she might be able to get through uh, Super Tuesday, which is when a lot of states hold their elections uh, coming up next week. And if she, you know, assuming that she, nothing changes between now and then in terms of her share of the vote, then she might quit after that. She's, she's not going to go all the way into uh, May or June. But I would point out, Akiko, 
she did get 40 percent of the vote in South Carolina. Trump got 60 percent. So she didn't come close to beating him. But there are some political analysts saying that is a bad sign for Trump that this is among Republicans. This is not among, um, you know, a general election set of voters. This is among Republicans. She got 40 percent. That's a bit of a worrisome thing for Trump. And there actually are some polls showing that Biden is starting to do a little bit better in these head to head matchups against Trump. So onward we go to the Biden versus Trump rematch. Onward we go. And Rick Newman will be with us every step of the way going into November. Rick Newman, thanks so much for breaking that down for us. See ya. Well, coming up, tech giants gathering in Barcelona this week and in focus, generative AI in devices. How much smarter are smartphones going to get? We'll have more on this after the break. The Mobile World Congress kicking off in Spain today. The integration of generative AI in devices, a big focus in Barcelona. For more on what consumers can expect, let's bring in Nabila Popal, IDC Research Director of Consumer Devices, to break it all down. Uh, Nabila, good to talk to you today. We got a bit of a preview on what that experience is going to look like with AI in devices at CES earlier this year. What are the big headlines you're expecting out of Barcelona this week? So, you know, Certainly, as you've all heard, no surprise, right? AI is a big, uh, big buzzword. Um, five years ago, it was 5G, and before that, digital transformation. But this year, it's it's all about AI. AI everywhere, AI in devices, AI in PCs, and certainly at Barcelona, you know, AI in 
smartphones. So um, as of now, you know, we've, we're seeing across the board, all vendors, OEMs, and, you know, industry players really push the, the AI agenda. We've seen launch from um, Honor uh, yesterday, which was really, it, really humming the, this AI method with their new um, Magic 6 Pro series, as well as their um, foldable phone. So, you know, it's, it's and that's another segment that, you know, we, we expect to be booming. So certainly this year, uh, we are expecting AI devices um, or generative AI, right, on device to, to boom um, in the industry, ramping up to about 170 million devices for this year. Um, you mentioned Honor is one that has sort of unveiled their device. We, of course, have seen Samsung launch their AI device. Sure. Fundamentally, what has changed in terms of the smartphone experience right now as it stands as a result of that technology? Sure. And, you know, that's, that's you know, you, you bring up a great point because it's so confusing, right? There's AI, then there's generative AI, and then there's next gen AI on device. So what does it all mean really at the end uh, for the consumer? Because when you get into the, the technicalities of things, it can get confusing, right? Like AI or generative AI on device must have large language models or must have stable diffusion and yada, yada, yada. But what does that really mean for the consumer? And I think if we want to hone down on what is the difference. So what is the difference from how AI has been a part of smartphones for a, day, a decade, honestly, um, until now to what's happening today, right? What is the new, the the, the craze that's, go, whether it was what Samsung announced, um, you know, earlier this year or now that's going to be announced for the rest of the year. So what is the real difference? Specifically on Gen of, AI though, what's the difference? Yeah. Exactly. And so that's the that's the word that we want to focus on. So if you, you know, generative AI is, and then on device. So generative means it's not just smart or intelligent, but it can generate things. So it can create um, whether it's, you know, summarizing our tons of work emails or our family group chats. I mean, just giving some consumer, you know, examples, right, that consumers can understand. And also read more recently stuff like the magic eraser, like removing things from pictures or generating new pictures. Um, it's things like this. They're still very early. Early, the use cases um, have yet to be, you know, developed where that's really going to create that mass um, consumption and run to, you know, purchase the new AI device, right? So that's what we're really waiting for. Um, the smartphone industry is already at the cusp of recovery, but the question is, are these AI devices really going to cause that next wave of super cycle, you know, refresh? Um, are they going to lead the, the boom and? Uh, or rather the recovery, right? But the, the answer to that is it's really not in number. They're still gonna you know, make up probably about 15% of the smartphone market this year um, with that 170 million number that uh, forecast that I threw out earlier. So what's, you know, what's, when is, the, are they really going to so, take off? And to some degree, it's really, yeah, what, because they're gonna be- What does that sorry, target the, look like? What does that target look like? If it's not this cycle, with the devices that are being unveiled this year, when does that upgrade cycle really take off? And what are the brands that are uh, best positioned? Um, so, you know, I would start with, um, honestly, like every single flagship launch this year and probably for the years to come is going to incorporate some element of AI um, experience, AI features. Uh, right now, we would say all the flagship uh, coming out of all the brands we saw with starting with Samsung this year, Samsung certainly um, in a in a uh, great position right now, and you know all the Android players as well. Apple also pushed the message a bit toward the end of their earnings, although they haven't really marketed anything, you know, the, with the AI message yet. Uh, but we're eager to see what you know Apple comes out with the end of this year. But as of now, really the the Android players, starting with Samsung and then Honor, um, Xiaomi also had an event today, although they didn't really, um, you know drum the AI message too much. They focus more on camera specs, which is also a leading um, uh, attribute that consumers are seeking and premium features, right? Premium part of the market is growing. So we do see numbers taking off, but it's really also because AI is really going to be embedded in the premium part of the market, which has been growing significantly. So it's, it's really um, a matter of when those AI features become mainstream that they will create that. We don't see that happening, um, you know, when the AI will become out of flagships into the mainstream devices. It's, I think we're still a few years out. Mm -hmm. Nabila Popal, IDC Research Director of Consumer Devices. Good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Good to be here.
Well, coming up, a landmark hearing for big tech could forever shape the way we consumer, we consume content on social media. We get, we'll get you the details on the other side. Well, big tech is in the hot seat with the U.S. Supreme Court hearing two cases this week weighing on whether state laws that seek to regulate big tech are a violation of the First Amendment. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance tech editor Dan Halley, who's tracking this story for us today. Dan, you know, obviously we've got to hear out the case here, but what are the implications potentially for the way these platforms are run? Yeah, Kiko, this could have massive implications for not just the way uh, organizations like social media run, but the entire Internet. So uh, let's just break it down real quick. The, co the court is hearing uh, arguments over two laws, one in Florida, one in Texas. They both uh, vary in certain ways, but what they really come down to is whether or not social media platforms are able to kind of editorialize or, or remove speech from their platforms, whether uh, someone posts something that's... Uh, you know, quote, lawful, but awful. Uh, and they're then able to take it down or if they have to leave it up. So the platforms have argued in the past that they should be able to be uh, take that kind of content down. Uh, and uh, others argue that they should allow it to remain up. Now, this these kind of came about uh, after uh, former President Trump would, uh, was banned from certain social media platforms following the attack on the Capitol on uh, January 6th. Um, and so this is kind of the continuation of those conversations. And really uh, what we're, we're kind of looking for is, as the ultimate resolution could come down to companies have to allow all speech on their platforms, 
which could push away users uh, and advertisers, or companies will have to severely uh, moderate uh, what's on their platform. So they wouldn't allow any kind of uh, uh, speech related to anything political almost. Uh, and so they may not be able to uh, talk about elections or something like that. Uh, they would take those down just to ensure they don't have to uh, deal with any potential issues related to these uh, cases. And so, you know, this is something that uh, won't be decided until sometime around June, perhaps, uh, but it, it wouldn't just apply to you know, Facebook, Twitter, uh, the like. Uh, it would apply to Google. It would apply to uh, uh, Wikipedia, Reddit. Uh, anything that's out there really uh, would, would potentially be impacted by this. So it, it comes down to, is this kind of content going to remain online? Uh, will it not? Or or will the judges just decide that uh, the, the status quo can continue uh, as we've seen it? Dan, what have we heard from some of these social media companies ahead of these hearings? Yeah, a lot of them uh, have pushed back on these uh, laws. Yeah, anything that would require them to keep speech that they don't want online uh, would, they say, go against their First Amendment rights. Uh, it would basically be forcing them to uh, speak in a way that they don't want to or, or have content posted in a way uh, that they don't want to. Part of that has to do again with with the users. Do they do users want to see content that they find uh, otherwise reprehensible or uh, is is misleading? Uh, if they don't uh, and they're forced, the platforms are forced to carry it. Then they may, you know, dip out to another platform entirely. Uh, the same goes for for their advertisers. So you know, we've seen advertisers leave platforms. Uh, X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, being one of the main ones when. Uh, objectionable content shows up near advertisers' advertisements. And so uh, if these laws are allowed to, to go forward uh, and companies do have to allow anything on their platforms, well, then advertisers will think twice about advertising there and, and seeing where content appears. Uh, if you know they're able to uh, remove content, it's basically the, the status quo. But if they do, in some instances, in, in one of the laws, uh, they'll have to provide an explanation as to why uh, they remove the content. That can be automated, perhaps, but uh, the, the platforms are saying it would be uh, arduous for them to come up with ways of doing that. We'll be watching closely. Dan Halley, uh, breaking that down for us. Thanks so much. Let's do a final check of the markets before we let you go. It feels like investors are in a bit of a holding pattern, if you will. If you look at where things are trading, pretty flat so far. The Dow up 25 points, the S&P 500 down just slightly, and the Nasdaq up 38. Of course, investors bracing for some more economic data later in the week, with core PCE certainly in focus. We see communication services and utilities seeing the biggest declines on the day so far in the session. That does it for me in the 11 a.m. Eastern hour. We've got much more to come here on Yahoo Finance. Keep it right here.